Welcome to this edition of the Fashion uh, Brexit. Um, I'm really happy myself and Humberto here to uh, welcome you in this edition. It has been uh, four years now that we have started this adventure together. Um, I think Humberto, if you recall, the first one was in Copenhagen and it was in 2019. This one, that one was uh, of course in person. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, and then we had two editions, 2020 was fully virtual, 2021 was a hybrid one in Amsterdam. And today uh, we are really happy to have the fourth edition uh, as a fully virtual one for you. Uh, we have published the papers and, uh, in different uh, special uh, editions of Springer, so you all have access to them. And let's take a look. What do we have today, Humberto? I would like to pass it to you. Yeah, big welcome from my side, of course. Uh, today, I don't want to ruin the surprises. Uh, we have a program uh, full of uh, really interesting talks, both from researchers and invited talks. And we have a wide breadth of topics that we're covering, like recommendations uh, of outfits, recommendations about items, returns, size and fit. So we're gonna be talking about um, a lot of the problems that we're facing when we talk about recommender systems for fashion, which is really, really excited. And maybe we can start with the uh, invited talks with no further ado. I think everyone's really excited to hear the, the first one. Uh, but thank you. <laughs> just, just to, so everyone is aware of the structure, we will have uh, four talks, and then we will have a 30 minute break because we know everyone needs to take a, a bit of a break from the computer. And then we will come back with um, the, the second part of the workshop, um, which goes until 9.30 in Amsterdam time. Hard for me to know where everyone else is, but uh, hopefully you have your time calculated there. All right. Thank you very much. As the first speaker, we have Silvia. Uh, Silvia, please Hi. go ahead and share your slides. Um, um, so let me double check that. You should be seeing my screen now. Right. Yeah. Yes, perfect. So okay. Silvia is a data scientist in Farfetch, uh, recommendation and personalization. Uh, I think, Silvia, you have been part of the organization of the CIR Ecom Challenge. Uh, today you are with, with us to tell us more about the data set and the challenge. Um, what were the learnings there? Uh, please take it away. Yes. I will. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, like Riza mentioned, I am going to tell you about the data challenge that we organized for CIR uh, earlier this year, where the topic was to do fashion outfits recommendations. So first of all, this challenge was organized by a lot of people at Farfetch. We are all data scientists from the recommendations cluster, covering people from personalization, uh, product recommendation, and automated outfit generation. We all came together to work on this data set and take a little bit of time to interact with the community in this way. So in case you don't know, I will do a very brief introduction of Farfetch. So Farfetch, we state the, uh, the company mission as uh, to be the global platform for luxury fashion by connecting creators, curators, and consumers. So how does this work in practice? Say that you have a boutique somewhere in France and say that this boutique wants to be able to sell to a wide variety of customers rather than only their local ones. Uh, if they join the group of boutiques that works with Farfetch, we essentially um, take their products, take the pictures, make sure that the data is all correct, put them online uh, for sale. The product will exist at that boutique and then whenever any cu customer anywhere in the world goes to farfetch.com either on mobile or the website they will find this product they will buy them and then we also take care of the shipping process back to this consumer a few numbers uh, as of december 31st 2021 Farfetch is a platform that has over 3.7 million consumers which gives you a little bit of a notion of the scope of data that we tend to work with 
Uh, we partner with over 1,400 of the world's best brands, boutiques, and department stores, and we ship orders to over 190 countries. In terms of staff, we are over 7,000 people spread all over the world in a lot of offices. So, uh, so why did we decide to organize a data challenge? There are several reasons to do this. Uh, one of the main ones for us was the, the, we noticed that a really good way to make sure that we can develop, publish and compare methodologies is to make sure that there's enough resources so that everyone can participate in this cycle. So this was a way to start going into this process of sharing data with the entire community and making sure that it fits the standards that people expect and that people are aware that this data set exists. It's also a really great way to engage with the scientific community because by setting up a problem, we all have a common goal and a lot of very interesting discussions are fostered in this way. So this is a very important part of, of maintaining this relationship between uh, industry and academia, I believe. The last point is that over the years at Farfetch, we have uh, developed quite a lot of expertise in this particular problem, in the problem of automa automating outfit generation. And it's always interesting to have an opportunity to both pick people's minds on how they would tackle this problem and also a great venue to share how we should solve this problem ourselves in the scope of Farfetch.com. So speaking of automated outfit generation, how does this exactly work? What do I mean by that? So at Farfetch, we have access to several outfits that were manually curated by fashion experts. If you look at the left-hand side, you see a typical outfit that is uh, manually curated. And you can tell because there's a picture of a model that is wearing all the pieces. So what happens is that if you're looking at one of these pieces, you will see a, a model wearing the entire outfit and all of the individual products that make it up. However, given the size of our catalog, it is obviously not feasible to have outfits for every single product. Also, if you want to come up with a, a, a way to personalize outfits, you, you would be essentially taking pictures of clothes forever. So obviously automatic outfit generation is the answer to this problem. On the right hand side, you can see such an example of an automatically generated outfit. You can see that there's the, there is a picture of a model wearing one of the items, but the outfit was generated for one of the out, uh, items in an automatic way. And this is possible, of course, because we have access to this manually curated data. We are able to train models and validate them against these outfits that were manually curated by experts. So this task is incredibly complex because it's not simple to quantify what makes an outfit good. So we didn't want to come up with an incredibly complicated challenge for the scope of this data challenge. So we had to make it a little bit simple so that it was accessible to more people in the community. So we turned this into a problem that is typically called the fill in the blank problem. For several of the outfits that we have, we essentially mask one of the products out of the outfit and the task that the models that will be trained will have to solve is out of a list of candidates, which one correctly completes this outfit. Of course, to make this a little bit more challenging and to create a little bit of variety in uh, the, the lists of candidates that we provided to people, we came up with two sets of candidates. Uh, one outfit only has one set of candidates, but they are generated in two different ways. You have easy candidates where we essentially sample a bunch of random products from the product catalog, and those would be the possibilities to fill in the blank. And we have harder candidates where we only choose products that belong to the correct category. This means that we are trying to create a, an incentive for models to not simply learn relationships between product categories, but actually learn something about style and choosing something that actually matches what is already there rather than simply hitting the correct category. So what did the data set look like? Uh, it contains the three data sources. The first one is a set of expert curated outfits identified by an outfit ID and uh, the sequence of product IDs that make up this outfit. We also share product metadata such as category, color, brand, price, and the full text description of the product. And we share uh, product images. So for each product, we have a frontal centered white background picture for, for, for that product. In terms of numbers, the data set contains a total of 270,000 manually curated outfits. For the challenge itself, we kept out 30,000 for evaluation, 
which means that we shared with everyone 240,000 complete outfits and then 30,000 outfits where one item was masked and the list of candidates was provided along it. The outfits are made up of 300,000 unique products and we made sure that there was a little bit of overlap in terms of products between the train and test set because certain approaches benefit or would be severely hindered if some products were exclusive to the test data set and never seen in train. In case you're interested, the full data set is undergoing revisions and we're working on the paper that will accompany it and it should be released to the community within the next few months. So the other thing that we provided people besides the data was a way to quickly evaluate and benchmark their solutions. We came up with an extremely simple benchmark, simply a random uh, a selector out of the candidate items, randomly select one of these items, and that would be the baseline for uh, our leaderboard as well. So to summarize the task itself, for every test, test outfit, we have a list of candidate items, and one of these items will be the correct one that completes the, the, the outfit. A model will choose an item out of this candidate set and it will either get it right or not. So this is a binary metric, you either hit or you miss. Then if you take the average over your entire uh, set of predictions, you will see the percentage of times that you got it right. And this is how we ranked people in the leaderboard during the competition. The competition was hosted on an external platform called Eval AI. Uh, it made certain things very easy, like automating sending emails, uh, setting up state phases and leaderboards and private and public submissions, things like that. Uh, and in terms of phases, we had two phases during the challenge. The longest one was uh, lasted for around one month. We did not hold any sort of restrictions in terms of how many times you could make a submission. And it was kind of a time for you to get your hands dirty with the data and try out whatever you wanted to try out. For the last few days before we closed the challenge, we limited this quite dramatically and re released the, the last half of the leaderboard of the, the held out test data. Uh, it's when we score participants and we reduce the number of, of submissions you can do in a day, essentially to avoid having people training to, to exploit the, the leaderboard results rather than the metrics. All in all, we have 20 registered teams, over 150 submissions. Uh, a lot of people submitted papers with their solutions. Two of them were accepted to be published in the conference proceedings. Uh, something I didn't mention, we did uh, offer vouchers, far-fetched vouchers for the top three candidates who, as you can see, had quite high uh, uh, fill-in-the-blank scores. Two of them also presented their results to, for the CGIR workshop and then internally for us at uh, an internal talk at Farfetch. In terms of lessons learned, it was very interesting to see uh, some insights for the particular task of automated outfit generation. However, something that in hindsight is very obvious and we were expecting it to happen is that in these contexts, the goal is to, it's a competition, the goal is to win. So what a lot of the approaches that were done for this challenge did not really translate into uh, an amazing way to generate an outfit from scratch. They were just a really good way to select the correct candidate out of a fixed list, which does not match the reality of our day to day when we have hundreds of thousands of candidates and we start very often from one and then add iteratively to build an outfit. It was really, really cool to see how diverse the community was. We had a lot of students, researchers, machine learning practitioners. And it was also cool to see that uh, many companies endorsed the participation of their employees into this challenge. So they took uh, time together during working hours and worked together for this challenge, which was really, really cool. Uh, something that is very, well, it may be obvious and it's a lot of work is, um, understanding how to design a data set that is useful for the community. So there was, of course, a lot of work that we had to do coming up with the candidates. This is very specific to uh, the challenge itself. And there are other considerations that we have to have when we're talking about sharing the uh, data set with the community at large. So this is something that we're working on, as I mentioned, and pretty soon, hopefully, you will be able to get your hands dirty with this data set as well. So this is all I have for you today. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, we are open for questions. Uh, 
you can either unmute yourself if you have a question and ask the question or put it in the chat uh, to everybody. So let's take a moment so that people can prepare their questions. There's one question. A simple question. <laughs> um, so uh, let me read it answer. aloud. Ah, thank you. Are we able to reach papers that you mentioned accepted? Uh, I believe so. They were published within the proceedings, which I think are uh, publicly available. So yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Deshar has a question. Go for it. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for, uh, for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I just had two, two bit, uh, simple questions here. Uh, one is regarding basically the outfit uh, answers that you provided to the, to the authors. Uh, they seem to be like from different categories. So it seemed category information could be like used here to help, no? Maybe yeah. in general, if they are from the same category, the options, it would have been a bit more challenging. Yeah. But the second thing that I would like to pinpoint here is, uh, I don't know if you have used visual signals here or the cat or the, or the authors were somehow asked to use the impact of the visual signal. The point is in, I think in real commercial system when we are interacting with these fashion items, the timing of interaction impacts our opinions. So what I mean by that is that the visual signal we get from the fashion items gives us an impression about the entire outfit but then we could like the item or not, right? So at the end of the day, the purchase, the final purchase comes when you look at when the visual signal is positive and also you like the metadata. So what I mean, this timing of if people interact or finally buy, two types of signal can impact that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, General, it could be interesting to consider this uh, to, to build a realistic fashion outfit recommendation or fashion item recommendation in general, the impact of visual signal uh, in conjunction with the final with the final interaction preference score we are we are using. So for example, if it's if it's interaction with the item or the final the final purchase, which in which the user considers all all the signals getting from the item. So yeah, just my two two few cents. No, uh, for the first half of your question, we we were worried about that as well, and that's why we made up hard and easy candidates. So some, if we had thirty thousand test outfits, half of them had candidates that were all from the same category, and there indeed it's more difficult because you really have to understand which one. It's not just about figuring out that if you don't have shoes, you need shoes. It's about figuring out which shoes out of a full set. Um, and the, the second half of your question, it's, it's very interesting. It is important to see, though, that there's a difference between coming up with a perfect outfit for a person who is browsing and has a history of interaction and what the fashion experts do, which is come up with a fashionable outfit that is kind of inspirational. So. This task specifically has to do with this inspiration stage. It's not personalized. It's not about what you have been seeing and if this motivates you, if this outfit is something that you see yourself wearing. It's more about if we're a luxury shop, if we are talking about like fashion experts giving people inspiration and, and kind of being trendsetters, can we mimic that? Can we take the information from the outfits that were manually curated and come up with some style some very stylish algorithm that is able to do this as well. So it's two different questions. We were focusing on the first here, but 
it is important, of course, to look at business metrics and there you do want to enter the how people interact with things and, and catering to the person's needs and, and tastes. So that's the follow up to this work, essentially. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a few questions in the chat. I also invite participants to raise their hand as just Yashar did, if you want to ask your question live. Let me go to the chat. Um, Justina asks whether the task was to find a matching outfit. The task was essentially to, out of a set of candidates, choose the best one to complete an outfit. So it, it, was, it was completing the outfit rather than creating one from scratch, for instance. Thank you very much. And we have Jacob that asks, can you describe how Farfetch solved the outfit generation problem? I, I'm not involved in that particular project. I can give you some, some overview and I am actually not 100. Perhaps if Bio is on the call, he can let people know if there's a publication uh, regarding this, but uh, it has to do with both uh, figuring out which categories make sense together and visual uh, uh, characteristics from the products that make up an outfit. So iteratively going through a graph of categories to see what makes sense to add to an outfit and then to narrow down which ones visually make sense for that category. Something along these lines. Thank you very much. Diogo, are you here with us? Yeah, I am. Uh, so regarding publications, we are still not, we didn't public, uh, publish yet the, um, the paper. Uh, it's a uh, uh, team of Luis Bahia also. Um, and it's uh, like Anna Silvia said. So it's a category graph to, to pick the candidates, like to find the hard candidates. And then within the hard candidates, it's a sequential model that tackles multimodal embeddings based on text information of the products and the brands composing the products and the visual uh, information extracted by CNNs and stuff. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Looking forward to that, if it gets published. Thank you, Diego. Um, uh, there is this follow-up question. Uh, another question, given that the solutions were good at fill the blank task, but not so good in the real world, do you think that fill the, fill the blank task is uh, useful for training real world outfit generators? So I think let's start from there. Or is there another task which might be maybe better suited? Uh, the, the issue with fill in the blank is first, if you want to be able to compute it, you need a lot of data. You need a lot of outfit data. And that's that was a little bit of a problem if you're not far fetched And this is one of the reasons why we wanted to make this data set public. There aren't that many data sets where you have the luxury of having a ton of outfits that you can mask items out of and see if you're good at this particular task. But I think it is a good proxy for it. You can also make this a little bit more complex and, and, and try to go from one product to as close as possible to the entire outfit. But it is a simplification and it is focused on finding the one missing piece rather than everything else. Uh, the approach that ended up being used, like Diogo was mentioning, has to do with an iterative walk through a graph of things that we extract from the outfits, like what combinations of items make sense. And you go step by step until you reach the step where you have the fill in the blank problem, essentially. So it's not totally used. The, the, main, the main reason why I mentioned that this didn't translate very well to a solution that could be implemented has to do with the fact that we selected the candidates for each outfit. When in reality, rather than having 10, 20, 40 options for one outfit, you have hundreds of thousands of options for one outfit. And the solutions that the participants came up with were very tuned for this limited set of candidates and did not translate particularly well if you would try to do that with a gigantic set of candidates as we do have uh, in a live setting. Thank you very much. I will go to Bertrand's question. Is the outfit generation implemented in Farfetch? Any new things learned that can apply from the competition? There's a second part to the question, but let's answer those ones. Uh, there were a lot of interesting things in the competition, particularly to do with how to evaluate outfits. So and there were a lot of different strategies so that could be kind of, it, they would not replace uh, the, the, the entirety of the model that is currently alive, 
but there were a couple of interesting insights into how people chose to use some of the data that was provided and how people formulated the problem, particularly for this last task with the fill in the blank, treating it sort of as a classification problem, other people treated this like a recommendations problem. So there were a lot of approaches that, uh, despite being interested in theoretically, I don't think there was anything that would completely uh, replace or let, lead to like re-implementation of what is currently led. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this other question goes a little bit beyond the purpose of this talk, but let me go for it. Uh, are there other solutions attempted in Parfetch, for example, using object detection of the items in the model outfit photos? Yeah, it's one of the reasons why we share the photos and we, we have access to more than what we shared because it became intractable to share very many photos for this particular data set. But yes, doing uh, image detection or, or image analysis is a big part of the model because we, and it makes sense, right? Because we're looking for things that match and visual characteristics are very important there. So one of the parts of this model that does automated outfit generation does involve extracting features uh, from, from the visual characteristics of these pictures and then using their embeddings in the, the multimodal model to come up with combinations that make sense. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, Justina asks, uh, who provided the, the data, I wonder? My guess is that the question is about the, the annotation part, uh, but let's cover that question, who provided the data? Uh, it's it's fashion experts that work at Farfetch. So it's stylists that work on the photo shoot part, come up with a combination of products, and that's enough. Perfect. And then how actually did you test the results? I think what is interesting in the question, I will focus on that, is the outfit is probably subjective. For instance, I don't want to have a usual outfit other people use. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And it's, again, a little bit related to what I talked about briefly a little bit earlier. Uh, here, the goal is, can we automate the goal, the role of the stylist? Can we automate the role of the person whose job is looking at a lot of products and come up with an aspirational combination, something that is stylish according to their definition of style, which should follow like the market's definition of style. Uh, when it comes to personalization, that's a very different question. And it's indeed much trickier to validate then you can come up i know that we internally have metrics to qualify an outfit that have to do with how the products go together if brands are consistent or or if if there's some sort of, of similarity in terms of i don't know several different factors uh, but translating this is to does this person like it or not? Just something that you do have to take into an online testing setting to, to really get down to. So indeed, personalizing outfits and coming up with good offline metrics for if they work or not is extremely complex. I have difficulties coming up with an outfit that I find stylish for myself basically every day. So the machine learning model has it much harder. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up in the chat and also nobody has raised their hands for a question. Uh, I think let's give it another moment. We have a fan. That yeah, I have one question. question. Yeah, go for it. Right, so the outfit data, do we know the purpose of the outfit, for example, for what occasion? Like any mm -hmm. metadata describing the purpose no, the, okay. the outfits at this point are, are static. For that product, you have an outfit. You don't have outfits that are related to particular events or settings, at least in this data set. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Justina is curious what was the winning prize. I think we, we mentioned that. It was a Farfetch voucher. And mm -hmm. also those two papers got accepted in the main conference. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. That was a really great way for us to learn more about this data set. And it is available. Please, everybody who is working on this topic, <laughs> go forward, get your hands dirty. We will have the full data set, as I understood, available in a few weeks. Exactly. That's it from the, this one, I would believe. Thank you very much, yes. Sylvia. Thank you. And with.
that one, we would like to go to our second invited talk. Uh, that would be Nick. Nick, are you with us? Can you hear me? Hi. And maybe you can also start sharing your screen so we check if all works. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. So just a few words uh, from my side. Nick is a chief data scientist at the recipe. Uh, he was involved uh, in co-organizing the, the Brexit challenge uh, this year. And we are really happy to have you here to tell us a little bit about the learnings, what was the challenge about, and the floor is yours. Okay, awesome. All right, um, yeah, so the Rexus challenge was just now. Obviously we had the challenge workshop yesterday. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the challenge. I uh, won't go into all of detail um, because we just did <laughs> yesterday, but um, I do have some pretty interesting sort of high level um, findings and learnings, I think, that, that I'll be able to share. So um, about Dressipy. So just as, as a sort of background, um, Dressipy is a personalization and forecasting service. And we, we work for online fashion retailers. Um, so we have many different clients. Um, and we are not a place that, so we don't have items ourselves. Um, we do this personalization service for other online retailers. Um, for Rexus and for this, the relevant thing is our personalization product. So we have outfits, some items, item and straight item recommendations um, and a couple of others, but these are sort of our flagship products. We just heard a lot about outfits. So I won't go into too much detail there, um, but essentially, so the outfits and the similar items products, um, they have they have two components. They have the sort of core algorithm in the background, which will determine what is a good item to recommend for, for a user. But then there's also the sort of um, product or user journey uh, side of it, where for outfits, obviously, all the things you show have to go together. Uh, for similar items, even though, so similar items is when you're looking at an item and we show you items that are similar to that. And there might be an item that the algorithm thinks sort of for, purely from personalization, that this would be a perfect item for you, but um, it has to be still similar to that item that you're looking at in terms of sort of to, to have a consistent user journey and, and so that the messaging is uh, correct when we say this is an item that is similar. So these are sort of things that um, take the, the core personalization algorithm, but then apply other things as well. And the item the sort of straight item recommendations uh, product is where there's the most freedom. So this is if you're on the home page or a category page, and then we are free to recommend you say the, the best dress uh, for this person. And for the challenge, um, we kind of, we we're focusing on this personalization part itself and not really on the outfits or, or these other product related uh, things. So, um, one thing that, that is relevant to mention also about Dressby, we do this thing, um, so we, we do this sort of product tagging or product labeling. Um, how that works is from our retail clients, we receive a product feed, which has a title, description, so textual description of the item and an image. And then it goes through our tagging process that will extract. So there's NLP components that will extract things from the title and description if it's available. Um, and then there's a very large computer vision component that will take the image and uh, predict these sort of labels. As you can see here on the right, um, there is, uh, depending on how complicated the product is or, or you know, for a dress, there will be a lot of labels um, for a t-shirt, less are required. So it's between 15 and 20, let's say, uh, labels per product. Um, and this goes, so this comes from a, from a computer vision system, but we do have a human in the loop component that is very important um, where we have our internal stylists, our junior stylists um, confirming and, and correcting uh, these predictions when they are wrong. Um, that, that actually has been a very interesting sort of UI 
problem that we had were how to make it so that um, we can, you know, we can use the size time efficiently and we don't, they don't have to look at individual products and <laughs> correct them, which will take a lot of time. So we've, we've gone through many different ways of doing that. And I think we have a pretty good way of doing it now. Um, and, and as time goes on, less and less things are wrong. And um, obviously we, we incorporate the corrections into the algorithms. Um, so the reason I go into all this, so this data was part of the data released for the challenge. Um, and before I go into the challenge in detail, so I think this is a very important thing to mention. Um, so we are a business and when I, when I come to a conference like Rexis, it's great, you know, to have interesting papers and interesting algorithms and everything. Um, but ultimately the thing has to work. And when, when we look at what should we try next and where we should we invest our time um, to actually, you know, implement things in production and actually run A-B tests and, and see if they work, um, there's a lot of possibilities. And so for us, when we read papers, it's really important that the results reported are actually applicable or that we can sort of, we have a good idea um, whether or not they will work for us for our domain. Um, so yeah, reproducibility, very important. Um, in recent years, Rexis has a track, a separate track for this, which is great. Um, and obviously, uh, this you know, there is these problems with the weak baselines and, and if you're working on a particular approach, it's very, uh, it's, it's kind of natural that when you have a result that says your approach is better than uh, a baseline that, that you're very excited to report that immediately. Um, and maybe, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to then go back and see, oh, but should I spend time tuning my baseline and making sure my comparisons are actually really uh, accurate. So anyway, it's very, so this is what makes it difficult for us to then kind of say, um, is this approach reported actually useful or, or actually valuable for us to try? And challenges is, is, are a very good way to do this um, because there is a third party, you know, the, the evaluator, the, the company running the challenge, um, and every, there's sort of a level playing field and everyone compares to the same thing. So that's, that's great. Um, so yeah, and this is kind of one of the reasons why we did this challenge. Um, obviously, the other reason is it's very different when, when people try their approaches on exactly your data set. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so this was, this was definitely a really great experience for us. Um, so the challenge was a session-based task. So the data set contains these sessions. Um, there's items that people have viewed uh, with a timestamp. And then there is a purchased item at the end. Um, and in constructing this, we've made sure that the purchased item comes after these. Um, and there, there's some sort of uh, trickiness in, in, in constructing this as well. So obviously to buy an item, you have to view it. Um, and if we tell you, know, tell you that they viewed the item and then you predict that they bought that item, that would be useless. So, um, we had to sort of, yeah, be careful in how we constructed it. So it's actually useful to us in reality. So what we've done is um, we give you everything that the person has viewed or that that was viewed in the session, um, but not the view of the item that they actually bought at the end. So that is taken out. And then a further thing we did on the, on the test sessions that, that you have to predict for is we actually cut the sessions at random intervals. So you only get the first X percent. So let's say the first half of the session and, and it's, uh, the uh, cut is random. So even sometimes you get the full session, sometimes you only get the first 50%. And that is because obviously you want to be able to predict this purchased item as early as possible. Um, and, you know, yeah, waiting until the very end and they're about to themselves view this item and then you're predicting it is, is not actually going to give you an incremental, you know, business value when you actually apply it. Um, so yeah, so you had the sessions and the purchases. And then the other thing you had was that content data, that labeling data that I talked about uh, just now. So this was kind of very exciting to us. If people can figure out what features um, are important when people are looking at things and what features actually end up in the item that they bought. Um, so why did we choose sessions? And, and, and so these, these sessions are anonymous, right? So you don't have a user ID, but you just have the session ID. 
So why do we choose sessions? Um, in our case, so we're not a Netflix or a Spotify or sort of a subscription service that has very committed and engaged users that keep returning and, and keep giving you uh, basically data about themselves. Um, because we work with these ex, you know, external sort of retail clients, a lot of our visitors are actually new. So on a, a lot of people will not have historical data. And if they do, they have very little. And you know, even then, uh, we all know that in fashion, preferences can change very, very quickly. So um, it's kind of the historical data is only useful to sort of a certain extent. Um, and it's very important to us to have to have an, an accurate in-session recommender. So this is why we, we made it a session task. We wanted people to really focus on this. Um, and obviously we have this rich content data um, and we want people to use that. So the data set, um, there is a million sessions in the training set. Uh, the test set was, uh, so the, the split was on date. There's a million training sessions and then there is 100,000 test sessions. Um, for the challenge, this was split into two. So the leaderboard test set and then the final test set on which you, you only had one chance to submit your predictions and that determined the winners. Um, and we have now, now that the challenge is over, we have released everything. Um, so including the, the sort of the correct answers. So of these, of these test sets used in the challenge. So we hope that with that, you know, people doing further work on this same data set, they can actually evaluate in exactly the same test sets and make, you know, that makes the, the results comparable to the challenge, which, um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So you can get this data set here, jasper.com slash datasets. It's available right now. Um, the evaluation process, just very briefly for the challenge, uh, it was yet to submit 100 predictions for each test session. Um, and so each test session only had one purchase to be found. So it was a very straightforward uh, metric. We used this mean reciprocal rank. So basically, um, if you rank the purchased item rank one in your 100 predictions, then that's the best result that you can get. And the lower down, it is the worse your result. Um, we had a lot of participants. So we had 250 teams that submitted at least one prediction file. Um, and then, you know, this was for the leaderboard. And then when we went into the final sort of stage, um, 50 teams, or, or I think 56 was the exact number, teams uh, submitted a solution for this final test set. And then we had 10 papers that we had accepted and in the workshop yesterday. So here is the three winning teams. Um, the best MRR was about 0.21 or 0.22. And so, yeah, some, here's, here's the learning. So I think this is, this is probably, um, I don't know, the most interesting slide. <laughs> uh, so one thing that was super interesting was that when we read the papers before the workshop yesterday, um, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, all these very complicated approaches and very large pipelines of, of different approaches and, you know, stacked together or combined. Um, and, and there was a lot of neural network transformers, you know, just a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, and, and these were really the approaches for the winning teams because it's a competition. And, you know, as we just heard in the, in the last talk, it's kind of people really want to win. Um, and the, to be the number one, you have to, you know, have that difference, which is 0 0.0001 difference, um, which, I mean, it's unclear if that's really translates to reality, to production. Um, it probably does not, but so when reading the papers, we thought, oh, so here's all these complicated approaches and the, the papers say that these are the things that made them win. So we should go and try this. But then yesterday in the workshops, it was very interesting uh, in, in the paper presentations, a lot of people said, um, okay, this is how we won, but actually a very, very large chunk of that is these very simple approaches. So, you know, with simple approaches, you can get to an MRR of let's say 0 0.19, and then your big complicated thing is what gets you to 0 0.2. So um, yes, it's, you know, more, but, whether or not that's really worth it um, is kind of questionable. Um, and again, I guess the other side is because this 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 part is sort of the personalized score or the personalized prediction part um, of 
of a bigger system where you have this and then it goes into your um, you know output system license logic or uh, even whatever you know many different other components and there it's kind of that little difference whether or not that will actually come through and in an a b test will give you an increase in revenue um, is kind of very questionable so uh, I think a very big outcome of this was yeah the simple approach is actually they you know to get you most of the way there. So if I, if I so think about the effort that people put in into their solutions, it's almost like a, you know, it's like a 95, you know, 95, five rule where it's 5% of the effort gave them 95% of the result. And then getting that last 5% was, you know, a lot of work. Um, so anyway, so that was, that was quite interesting. The other learning, yeah, recency. So I think we're all aware fashion uh, and fashion recency is important, but it was pretty interesting. Um, so we released a data, our data set had 18 months of data. And then most of the winning teams, I mean, some people tried to do seasonality with last year, which is kind of really why we released this large uh, time frames because we thought, okay, if there is something people can, can exploit it. But actually uh, most of the winning teams cut the data to like one month even or three months um, and threw away everything else and, and actually said that it was worse or, or kind of, it was either worse or equal when they uh, tried to include everything. So yeah, recency is really, really important. And, and we already knew that, but I mean, we're kind of surprised by, by how aggressive people could cut this. Um, and then my, my third learning is sort of this uh, secondary learning objective. So um, obviously in the challenge, the, the task was to predict the purchase and this is how you were evaluated. But then in the model learning parts, um, some teams did this thing where they train to predict, so they train a model to predict the purchases, but they also trained the, a model to predict views. Um, and they did it you know, in different ways. And this is kind of this idea of uh, masking or you know, it's called different things in different domains, but essentially um, you know, the, the masking ways to, to take out some of the views and then reconstruct them. Um, or you could do it, you know, a slightly different way where you just say, okay, I'm just going to uh, sample or, or create a second data set where the target is the views. And then you have to be careful of, um, obviously it's still more important to predict the purchase. So you want to fit to the purchase more than you do to the view. Um, but yeah, having both in there was better than only having one or only having the purchase, which um, to be honest, going into it, I wouldn't really have expected. So this was this was actually a, a very good learning for me. Um, I would have thought, you know, if you want to be good at predicting purchases, you fit your model to predict the purchases and that's the best you can do. Or, or if you try to fit for something else, it would make it worse. Um, but people figured out a good way to do this. So this is a very sort of high level, nice learning that we can take away because you can apply this to any learning algorithm. It's not, you know, very, it's not specific to just an approach. So um, yeah, so I was pretty, pretty happy with that. So that's about it for my talk. Um, feel free to ask any questions. So data set Z is available online here, or you can just contact me directly as well if you have, if you just want to get in touch. Thank you. Very much, Nick. And also for sharing the learnings, something that we don't always see through the papers, you know, where it works. And uh, the, that 95% and 5% you mentioned. I'm waiting for questions. They are coming in through chat. I wonder, maybe I just kick it off with one from my side. Um, do you know uh, from your evaluation where that few last percentages work on? So basically imagine you said the simple method gets us to 19, 0 0.19 and to get to 0 0.21, we need to do something complicated. Do we know where um, the, it works better? Uh, um, I mean, not from the papers <laughs> or, or so far, yeah. right? Um, so it's kind of, that's, I guess, another, well, uh, that it, it, it is very difficult. It is very difficult to figure that out. I mean, so internally we have sort of some ideas, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't, for for these, especially for these solutions in the in the challenge, um, I don't really know. I don't, I don't really have an answer. 
just got me thinking maybe that's also a fun metric to have in these challenges to see where the difference is and if that difference is meaningful for your business for example mm -hmm. okay let me with that i will go to the questions and please raise your hand if you want to ask your question live we have jacob that says can you describe these simple approaches i think you did a little bit of that uh, but if you have more for us yeah no i mean like uh, you know the, i mean like really simple like stuff like conditional probability like oh um you know the probability of buying this item given that you viewed this other item like it really to that level and i mean it's not only that one you have many of these different and then people try to do it's almost like a feature engineering where people you know given you viewed these um given you spent this much time viewing this one item you know based on the timestamps then what's the royalty you're going to buy this other item and sort of it's these very simple like uh, you know it's almost like correlate it's correlation methods um that they then combine together so i mean this was one of the presentations yesterday um but it, it's it's things like this um or i mean or just a collaborative filtering a very traditional collaborative filtering um and i assume i mean for, for the sessions you then have to put in some sort of a recency so you, so you weight it by um the last viewed item is more important than the first um but i mean that that's it basically <laughs> If you, if you have a, a recency waiting, you have a collaborative filtering, and there you go, and then you have like almost the the, the winning result, or a, you know, a very high result. I had a similar question. Uh, so basically, what is the simple approach for this challenge? I think we got that covered. Pierre, if you have more questions, please add the follow-up one. With that, I go to Justina asking. Um, more about what does uh, the company, the recipe, uh, do? And can you tell us a little bit? And also, she uh, it is the question: How many people were in the team? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I mean, yeah. So Dressby, um, so Dressby is, is a sort of uh, recommendation service provider for online retailers and especially for the fashion domain. So we say that we're really good at, you know. Personalizing for fashion, we're not very good at doing, you know, TVs or like whatever, electronics, fridges. We can't do books or, or movies or whatever. Um, and so, so our clients are businesses that want to have personalization on their site, but they're coming from a very traditional sort of brick and mortar background, um, and they're, they're trying to have, you know, the, the state of the art in personalization. Um, but they can't do it themselves, basically, or, or, you know, they would like to outsource this to us, which we continually um, improve our, our approaches. And so yeah, we provide this to them. We also have a, a sort of secondary business of forecasting a bunch of uh, and a bunch of sort of um, analytics types products. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, we're, we're a, a sort of a recommendation as a service provider. And our companies are large online uh, fashion retailers. And the team, I mean, uh, is that the, so the Dressby team, uh, Dressby is pretty small. So we have 35 roughly people uh, total in the company. So that, that, that is it. Um, the recommendations team is five people. And then there is, we have, uh, I mean, because our entire company is based, you know, this is our core business. There's a bunch of other teams to sort of support, but the algorithms team is five. Um, there is a separate data team to to take in all the data feeds from our clients there's a separate customer facing analytics team um and then the usual you know well there's a lot actually a lot of fashion expertise as well and um, then the usual business teams we'll go to humberto who has raised his hand and i invite also other people who can ask the question live please do so humberto uh, yeah thank you i have a more of um a, a different question is looking back and, you know, having people in the audience and maybe this question for, for both you, Nick and, and, and Sylvia, looking back and having people from the industry in the, in the audience, would you, would you say you would do this again, the process of releasing a data set and, and running a challenge? Would oh. you encourage other people? 
Um, I mean, I could start maybe. So I think, yes, I would, but I would definitely do it differently. So, you know, I think um, I've definitely learned a lot. So running the challenge was a lot, a lot of effort. Um, and I think we also made sort of uh, a mistake, I would say, or, or, or we set it up in a way where we had some assumptions. So um, what, and, and, and this is maybe kind of interesting to talk about for a little bit is, um, so when we released the data, we said, okay, here is you know the training data, here is the your test sessions, and for each of the test sessions, submit your predictions. And then one of the rules we made was you have to treat each test session as an individual test case. So you train your model only from the training data, and then you know you predict, you predict, predict. But while you're predicting, you're not allowed to remember or sort of make any further conclusions from these test sessions themselves right and so this was a rule and this is this is kind of well if i was doing this internally this is how i would evaluate it and so this is how i set it up but then there's a problem and <laughs> is that you know theoretically you do have the data so then you can say oh in the test sessions there are some relationships between the viewed items right and i can learn from that and you know this is this is kind of this gives you a competitive advantage and it's against the rules but um Big, you know, I didn't quite realize how competitive the competition is in terms of like people really want to win. So, so um, yeah, the, the, we actually there was a lot of discussion about this. There were some teams who were sort of um, saying, "Oh, the other teams are probably doing this." I can see that the score is higher than you know our score in the leaderboard, and are they doing this? And oh my God, are we losing because of this? And you know, and there was yeah a lot of discussion. So we we even. In the end, we even had to reopen submissions for for a while, and uh, to then you know and, and highlight that guys you know just remember that this is a rule and you know we don't want to check everyone's submission, but you know you have to you have to make sure that you're following the rules, um, and then a lot of people did resubmit. So it's kind of that was that was um, I think a slight mistake that we made in that. We should have set it up to, so there is no way that you can uh, cheat or or kind of do something that you're not not allowed to do, rather than relying on people to follow sort of just the rules that are just written, right? And a lot of people also just didn't really read the rules very very exactly. So if I was doing it again, I would do it so that um, everything we give you, you can use, then it's like fair for everyone, and and sort of make sure there's no way for anyone to uh, have an advantage that's not allowed. Very much. And we have a few quick questions. I will just go through them. Maybe we can answer them one by one. So Diego is interested that were the true positives removed from the session input? Um, well, which uh, so so for the training set, you had you know you had your views and you have your purchases, so you have everything. And then for the test set, um, yeah. You, uh, so in during the challenge, you don't know. Oh, okay, right. Okay, I think I understand the question now more. Uh, sorry. So this is this is uh, from the session input. So from these views. So yes. So when when we give you the data, um, we give you all the views up to the first view of the purchased item, not including. So so in your session views, this item will not be included. Um, and in the training set, then you have the item. You know that they purchased it, so it must have come somewhere after this. The view of it, um, yeah, and then the test set obviously it's hidden. How they or you dealt with the repeated signals? So I didn't catch the first part. Uh, so how did you deal with the repeated signals? You know, also how imp how important was the sequence for the purchase prediction on the solution? So there are two questions. One is about repeated signals, and the other about the sequence. Does that matter? Yeah. I mean, so repeated signals, uh, I assume, means so if you view the same thing again, right? Uh, is that? Um, yeah. So. <coughs> Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So. Um, I mean, yes. So I, th I think it, it is. It is. It is a very good, uh, important signal. Th I, mean, I think different teams handled it differently. Um, I mean, I know that. So. When, when we think about this, um, the repeated signal is very important. Um, I think the sequence and the 
the sequence is kind of the number one thing that's important. So the, you know, in, in the session based task, the last item, the last item you viewed is really like the most important thing. Um, and then it decreases the further you go back. Um, and then with the repeated, there's, there's sort of several strategies you can do. I mean, you can do um, less sort of an additive importance, right? So this, this is recent and it also was here. So it's extra important um, or you can just do uh, last viewed. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. I mean, we, we I think, so we use sort of an additive method, but um, there's many different ways to do it. But I mean, the main thing is really the the recency or, or the last viewed item in the session, even even inside the session, the recency is, is the most important thing I would say. Thank you very much in the interest of time. Maybe we just take an, the last one from Eduardo who, who is happy to ask it live. The mic is yours. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yep. Okay, hi. Um, so I also took part to the to the challenge and I also was also surprised by the fact that you can cut so aggressively the data to train your algorithm. So I was wondering if you had any idea of how to employ those data that you cut in some other way to improve the model that, that you train. I don't know, maybe like to refine the item representation that you learned through the model or some other way uh, instead of directly like dropping them and not using them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> in a way, right? <laughs> we released this to figure out if people can can find a way. <laughs> so, okay. um, I mean, so going in, really, our our um, assumption was that you know, if you go to the feature level and you're trying to learn things on the feature level, that there would be something in, you know, either. In seasonality, so oh, you know, last last year during the same season, there is maybe on a feature level a pattern that you can find, um, and then maybe that is still useful now. That was one thing, um, or I mean, yeah, it, it's really the the sort of things could be found if you're doing things on you know if you're doing it on a feature level was our assumption. Um, I mean, it's kind of, you know, for, I have to say, like for, as a conclusion from this. The, the, it seems like there is there is not that much value in that, or at least not in the specific data set, okay. um, and and that maybe you know the the recent, so the data that that was very recent maybe already covers everything, right? Um, the only uh, time that I could say where maybe it could be useful is when there is a change in season. So if there is a, a very sudden change in um, you know items go out and that new items come in and, and these items are new season items that are very different. And maybe at that point, using the last two months or, or the last three months as the teams did, um, would miss something because those items maybe don't have the features, right? Um, that, that have now come out with these new items. And so I think sort of at specific uh, turnover times for seasons, that's when you, it could be useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. There are amazing questions in the chat, and I invite everybody with those questions to make use of the coffee break to ask those questions back to Nick. With that, I would like for us to go to the next segment of this workshop. We had uh, papers uh, submitted to the workshop, and we have a few of them accepted here, and I would like to pass the mic to Humberto. Thank you, Reza. I'll be introducing the papers in the next sections until the, the coffee, virtual coffee break. Um, and the first one is adversarial attacks against visually aware fashion recommender systems. Um, and the presenters are both Gianluca, Gianluca Amatuli and Matteo Timonelli. Uh, so Gianluca and Matteo, are you around? Can you share your screen? Yes, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you and see you perfectly. Perfect, thank you. I invite my colleague Matteo to share the screen so we can start the presentation. Yes, one moment. Only one moment. Uh, I'm, I'm experimenting issues uh, uh, with this. Uh, 
Uh, you have to close and open again Zoom. Only one moment. Of course, it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without some some difficulties, right? <laughs> no I'm worries. Sorry. Maybe while 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 um, we resume, maybe you can write where are you joining from. Uh, I'd love to know where are people currently sitting on on their laptops. I know some people are in Seattle. Uh, which must have been really exciting. We have people from all over the world, I think. Uh, Italy, Budapest, Berlin. I see a lot of Berlin, New York, London. Some people from Bari, California, Italy. Oh, wow. Yeah, Seattle. Amazing. I'm trying again to share the screen. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, try to share the screen. Okay. Perfect. You can see it now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so good morning again, everyone. And I'm Gianluca, and me and my colleague Matteo are going to present a work called Adversarial Attacks Against Visually Very Fashion Outfit Recommender Systems. So I would like to start with thanking all the organizers and now my fellow um, co-authors of this project. So what are we going to see today? We're going to talk about a brief introduction and the motivation behind the work. Second, the method description behind it, a brief talk about results and discussion, and of course, the conclusions. So let's start. You know that recommended systems are everywhere around us. We can think about food, fashion, music, and sports. There are some statistics that says that Amazon has an up of 35% of sales, thanks to those systems, and also Netflix with an increase of 80% of views. But let's focus for the fashion domain. For example, let's see this picture from Zalando, which is one of the most popular platforms. We can need the recommendation because we have an abundance of products. Also, when we are, for example, buying some items, some fashion items like a jacket, we can need the recommendation of a scarf, a hat, or some pair of shoes. Also, we can make some educated guess about the personal life, personal style of someone and the working class. And also we can use the fashion as a way of expressing emotional status or emotions. So we have to make a distinguish between fashion item and fashion outfit. The first one we refer to is a single element, such as this case, the shirt, while the fashion outfit is a group of fashion items that is visually pleasing together. Of course, as we said, we're from Italy, so we have an enormous amount of fashion brands such as Versace, Gucci, GCDS, and Brunello Cucinelli. Of course, every one of them has a web platform and they use outfit recommended systems. We can see this screenshot from Versace website that already use it. Going forward, we can talk about the adversarial attacks. So let's talk about just for a second about the classification task. We have a function of data with X as input and Y as output. We can say that the adversarial attacks, the aim is to find a small perturbation called delta, such that the, uh, the output of this function is different from the original one. So the machine model, the learning models are really vulnerable to adversarial attacks. So the aim of the adversarial machine learning is to find a clever strategy to produce the delta as small as possible, so we can lead to wrong decision. For example, let's see this small pipeline. We have an image and input that goes inside the recommended systems. And we have as output a recommended list, sorted output list. But let's see what happened when introducing some noise, for example. So when we put an adversarial attack, we have an increase with uh, um, adding this small perturbation that goes inside the recommended system. Then we have as output another one, another recommendation. But here we have another sorted list. We can call this push attack because we're promoting a certain type of items or new attack we are demoting those items. So the objective of our research was to investigate about the robustness of cutting edge CNN models against those adversarial attacks. In particular, we focus on previously the robustness, but we want also to see all of the attacks effects respect to different attacks tasks. 
The first one was the visual clothing classification. And the second one was the outfit recommendation. So we can model problem and solution thanks to fashion recommended systems. Now I would like you to meet my colleague, Matteo. Matteo. Thank you, Gianluca. And so let's talk about data set and the tax description. Regarding the data set, we have employed Polyvore data set, which is a real world data set composed by more than 20,000 outfits. And uh, it is designed for recommendation tasks, but we have uh, produced also a version for classification ones. Uh, we have evaluated the performances of four different CNNs um, in both classification and recommendation tasks. And in particular, we have attacked these four CNNs, which are ResNet 15, BGG 16, DanceNet 169, and MobileNet V2, with FGM, BIM, Deepful, and PGD attacks. Of course, the networks were pre-trained over the ImageNet dataset and, has, and they've been fine-tuned over our datasets, and so the version derived by Polyvore. Uh, here we can uh, see uh, the two uh, mathematical expression of FGM and BIM. Regarding classification results, uh, in this table, uh, there are shown some values that describe tests that we have done. And in particular, it seems that uh, DanceNet 169 has the highest accuracy of on the, uh, the, our data set. And uh, the lowest accuracy uh, belongs to ResNet 15. Uh, regarding the robustness, uh, uh, something changes. This is because uh, ResNet 15 seems to be the most resistant CNN among the one that we have analyzed and we have stressed, while DanceNet 169 appears to be the, less, the least resistant one. Considering the ratio, uh, it, seem, it appears that ResNet has the highest ratio, uh, which means that it is the most resistant internet network among the one analyzed, but also VGG16 has a high value of ratio with respect to the others. Indeed, we have analyzed and stressed this two network with more budgets value and even with higher budgets. And it appears that ResNet is uh, uh, always this, uh, the most resistant network among these ones. Regarding the recommendation task, we have handled it as a uh, grading task. And indeed, our fashion recommender system uh, takes an input uh, different items that belong to the same outfit and says whether these items are compatible or not, so are bad combined or not. In this table, there are results of our tests, and in particular, it appears that the base accuracy of the overall model is uh, about 72%, and uh, the strongest attack is the full one. Indeed, is the only attack that uh, degrade the performances of our model, while FGM and BRM are almost ineffective. In particular, Deepful uh, is effective only with an high budget value and only on push attack, which means no to yes label flipping, which means that outfit that originally would be recommended as not good, uh, then are recommended as good. Uh, it's important to highlight that the budget value is really high. This is because uh, uh, fashion outfit recommendation is a really complex task. And so also attack strategy should be complex in order uh, to fool these models. Uh, here we can see an image of a push attack um, that has been done by Deepful. And in particular, it is evident the impact of the attack on the bag and on the necklace. And indeed, the SSIM values are lower with respect to the jacket and dresses one. Uh, regarding conclusion, we have suggested to you use adversarial attacks on two popular fashion prediction tasks, which are visual item classification and fashion outfit recommendation. And we have employed a really poor data set, uh, so Polyvore. And this means that this, it differs uh, with respect to, for example, fashion mist or mist ones, which contains uh, uh, less realistic images, but also with, uh, uh, was, more less with, was smaller with respect to Polyvore's one. And regarding classification results, it appears that ResNet 15 is the strongest network, while DanceNet 169 is the weakest. And so ResNet 15 is a wise choice among the CNNs uh, for as a defensive strategy. It uh, appears also that the strongest attack is Deepful and both in classification and recommendation tasks, but for recommendation one only on push attack, while on nuke attack it is unaffected. 
And indeed, on push attack on um, with deep full, the accuracy before and post attacks differs only by one one point two percent. And this highlights again that fashion outfit recommendation is a complex task. And so, to fool the model, we have to employ more complex strategies. Regarding future directions, we can say that sure, we can develop more complex approaches for fashion outfit recommendation. Uh, but also it could be interesting to identify the most prominent portion of an image in such a way that uh, we can uh, develop more complex attack strategy to fool uh, the fashion recommender model. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Gianluca and Matteo. Uh, really, really interesting talk. We already have some questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to ask their question um, directly, you can also raise your hand or unmute your microphone. I will start with a question by Ana Silvia. Uh, how would an adversarial agent influence a product image? Okay, Matteo, okay. if you want, I can go. And then- Yes, you can sure. Thank you, uh, first of all, for the question. Um, I think that we could try to propose an attack strategy maybe indicating a way uh, for the agent to put some noise in the product image, because this was the, the, the most important task. We would like to find a small perturbation. So for the human eye it was not so visible, so we can achieve all the best uh, results. So we can maybe suggest to attack those models, but uh, with a high budget, but paying attention uh, about the quantity of the noise that you put into an image. Very interesting. I'll, I'll, I want to do a follow-up a follow-up uh, um, follow um, question here. Is um, have you seen this sort of attacks already um, happening somewhere? Because I've seen definitely online a lot of people talking about attacks and how vulnerable some of these networks are. But do you have any experience already on while well, you were doing your research on this? No, we have not experience about this. Uh, we have decided to investigate about the robustness of, in general, CNN, and in this case, CNN, uh, CNN's application in fashion domain. And for this reason, we have investigated about the impact of adversarial attacks on uh, these models. But uh, no experience yeah. before. Maybe, maybe I can add uh, some information here. Uh, I think one interesting aspect generally about uh, about this uh, this research is that as as we know recommender system are predominantly based on collaborative filtering models so the type of attacks you you see nowadays on the on the commercial system are those attacking this kind of user item embeddings but we chose fashion domain because this is one of the really nice areas where images and 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 the visual signal has impact and we expect this kind of visual recommender system are growing. So I think robustness of this system becomes important in the, in the light of this, uh, this, this development on visual recommender system. And, and uh, fashion domain is a, is a very nice area of uh, basically uh, testing these things. And as, as you can imagine, there's a lot of commercial value also behind this. For example, if a competitor company could like by adding some noises simply to, to his product images can promote his products, you know, or demote the other company's products. So there's, there's gonna be a, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things that could be here thought about if these visual recommender system are in place. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matteo, Gianluca, Yashar, for uh, the presentation and the, and the answers. Um, thank you. Happy that someone is, is looking into this, this topic, which seems to be very, very important and uh, probably one of the first in, in presentations we had on it. Um, there are some questions, so I would invite you to please try to answer them on, on the chat, if you can, directly to the authors. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we're running late, as usual, because the topics are so interesting that, of course, we never have enough time. Uh, but I would like to invite Evgeny uh, Puzikov, who is an applied scientist at Salando, and will be talking about identification of fine-grained fit information from customers review in fashion. Welcome. Evgeny. Hey, hey, everyone. Uh, give me a second. I'll share my screen. Okay. 
Do you see the slides? Yes, we see uh, and hear you perfectly. OK, perfect. So hello, everyone. Um, name's Evgeny, an applied scientist at Zalando. Um, in this talk, I'd like to present uh, the results of an empirical study of topic extraction methods applied to customer reviews in fashion with an aim to identify fine grain fit information. So finding clothes that fit well is a big problem, as we know, and fit is not just size. So fit recommendations require more fine grained information to predict the fitting experience compared to the coarser task of predicting the best size. And we wanted to examine how unstructured data in the form of customer reviews um, can be leveraged to identify the topics corresponding to customer concerns, um, to common issues uh, of the item purchase and post-purchase experience. Um, and our work explored the utility of customer reviews in identifying these topics. Uh, we tested the utility of three typological different methods, latent Dirichlet allocation, text embedding clustering, and zero-shot text classification. And we showed that um, how the methods cope with the task uh, on various levels of granularity. So looking into more concrete, more applicable things that came out of the study, we found that the topic extraction methods can be great uh, review outlier detection systems. Uh, we also conducted some fine-grained topic analysis of customer reviews and obtained some valuable insights. So let's talk about the data first. Mm, in order to provide size advice, um, modern e-commerce platforms use various data sources, uh, which can roughly be broken into two, uh, product-specific information, customer-related data. And as for the former, we used expert-built annotations of articles across two dimensions, shape and fit. So this slide shows the taxonomy of fit and shape annotations um, used in the study. We have six shape, six shape labels and five fit levels. Uh, shape is the intended silhouette of an item in relation to the body, and fit is the width of an item. Um, as for the customer-related information, um, there are many. Uh, most systems use purchase histories, and surprisingly, customer reviews in the fashion domain have been largely ignored, although there is a lot of work in the text classification, text generation, style transfer literature, um, with most work focusing on restaurant or movie domains. So in this work, we show that customer reviews can be used to extract valuable information and kind of motivate the usage of the extracted knowledge to improve uh, Rex's recommendation systems. Uh, we collected approximately 15 million reviews in various languages for articles from 39 commodity groups. In this work and in this presentation, I'll focus on a subset of 10,000 short reviews that have been written in the English language originally. And, um, we used only reviews with a neutral or negative rating because we found that positive reviews rarely contain fit-related customer complaints, which is what we wanted to, to be able to detect. Um, and as for fit and shape annotations, you can see that the distribution of labels is not uniform, but um, it reflects the fit preferences of the general population of our customers. Um, so let's briefly talk about the approaches. Since customer reviews do not have any topic labels, it is natural to resort on supervised methods. Um, there are many, uh, but given the evidence found in the research uh, literature, we decided to focus on LDA and text embedding clustering. So LDA was chosen as the representative of the um, uh, frequency-based topic extraction methods. It is very stable in terms of performance. It produces interpretable results. Of course, we know about the embeddings. So embeddings offer a better alternative uh, to word core occurrence counts. Currently, the state-of-the-art approach of using text representations uh, is based on the variants of transformer like BERT. Um, and the specific approach that we experimented with was a three-step clustering pipeline. So we, we use a pre-trained BERT model to encode the review texts. Then we apply some dimensionality reduction technique. In, in our case, it was UMAP. Uh, and then we perform density-based clustering of the embedding vectors. Um, we compare LDA in the embedding clustering pipeline using the topic coherence metric, uh, which measures the degree of semantic similarity between the high scoring, between the high scoring words and the uh, discovered topic. Um, the higher the value, the more coherent the induced uh, cluster is. 
Um, the figure on this slide shows the average topic coherence scores achieved by LDA in the embedding clustering approach across a varying number of induced topics. So we tested three variants of the embedding clustering pipeline, depending on which embeddings the model used. Vanilla pre-trained model is EMB in this uh, slide. Same model, but fine-tuned on this 10,000 English customer reviews that I mentioned, this is EMB 10K, and the model fine-tuned on the 15 million multilingual customer rev reviews, which were auto-translated to English. Um, so we used a publicly available open source uh, library for that. And from this plot, we can see that the scores for the embedding pipeline are higher than those for LDA, even in the case of the embedding model that was just pre-trained, not fine-tuned. Uh, Fine-tuning on a small data set leads to better scores overall, but also very large performance variance. You can see that the bend is very wide. And uh, this finding is consistent with the recent studies, which suggested increasing the size of fine-tuning data, hence our experiment on this 15 million auto-translated reviews. However, uh, so despite the fact that the bend is now narrower, we can see that this score-wise, there's barely any improvement. improvement. Um, and last thing that I want to draw attention to is that um, increasing the number of topics did not lead to inducing more coherent topic clusters. So we explain this behavior by the fact that most reviews um, discuss more than one topic, which makes it very hard to separate reviews into coherent groups. Uh, one interesting finding is that the results of evaluation using topic coherence greatly depend on which reference corpus is used for topic coherence computation. So this plot shows two variants we compared in our work. Uh, the first one on the left is a collection of the original input documents used as the reference corpus. And uh, on the right, you can see what happens if you use a collection of super documents, like when, when all the clustered document in one cluster compose one super document. And then if you use a collection of those, then you get um, uh, lower scores and generally more unstable results, um, which I'm misleading. Um, manual examination of the outputs shows that both approaches detect around six, seven broad topic categories, which have their own more fine-grained components. For example, delivery issues is further fragmented into topics like received wrong item, not delivered, received, received damaged item, and so on. Uh, we processed the data with the trained LDA model and uh, counted the number of salient topics assigned to each review. And uh, in our experiments, a topic is salient if its proportion in the topic mixture is above 20%. There's nothing magical about the number. It's a heuristic number, kind of a sane estimate. And uh, the figure on the right on this slide shows that more than 60% of reviews are multi-topic texts. Uh, empirically, we observed that increasing the number of topics leads to more fine-grained, but also category-related clustering. So reviews about upper garments uh, would be fragmented into texts about jackets, jumpers, shirts, t-shirts, and so on. But for the purpose of this work, since we are, we are more interested in discovering review groups with feet um, related issues, and to achieve that, we designed two strategies. Um, the first one is iterative clustering. So after extracting the topics, we manually examine the text clusters and extract the reviews which were assigned to feed-related topics and then recluster them again. And uh, the figure on this slide visualizes the distribution of topics identified by this um, procedure. So it indeed allows us to identify feed-specific topics, for example, things like uh, fit critical areas, for example, sleeves, uh, neck, breast, shoulders. Um, the second strategy is CG-specific clustering, so focused on specific commodity group. Um, Fit-related issues can vary largely for different groups, and uh, uh, in our case, we focused on genes. Um, the slide shows that, uh, so this is a distribution of topics identified by the embedding clustering pipeline again. Uh, using the strategy, we can see that um, there are some uh, pit issues in the waist, thigh areas, leg length, and so on. So very useful strategy as well. Uh, but again, because uh, text uh, topic mixtures, is, uh, it's uh, contaminated by not so interesting topics as well. So um, two big disadvantages of both approaches is that they require manual examination of the clusters to assign a label, and it's very difficult to scale uh, the pipelines. Um, and uh, uh, we wanted to see whether this can be potentially addressed by employing some 
large pre-trained language models in a zero-shot type classification scenario. So the way it works is very simple. One defines the labels of interest, several prompts to allow for some variation, encode both the candidate reviews and the prompts with the trained language model, and then the model is supposed to predict if, if an issue described by the prompt is matching a given review. Um, so uh, we built a data set for this purpose, uh, used uh, human experts to annotate a very small data set for evaluation purposes, uh, used standard classification metrics as well, precision recall and F1 score. Uh, we experimented with two recent approaches um, and the random baseline and several classification setups. Um, basically, the takeaway message is that um, um, so the models do not work much better than random baseline. And a potential reason for this is that zero shot models are very sensitive to the prompt definition. So here you can see what happens if you change slightly the prompt and how badly the output probability changes. So essentially, you can add a full stop at the end of a, of a prompt or scramble the words in the in the prompt, and then you get surprising results, essentially. So zero shot classification didn't work for us. So moving on to the conclusion, let's summarize our findings. Um, we uh, took the first step towards combining article fit related data with the customer perception of fit. Uh, the results suggest that the extracted review can be leveraged to identify fit issues. Text embedding clustering pipeline performs best. Zero shot text classifiers did not work due to the, sen the sensitivity to prompt definition. Um, we also proposed some uh, strategies like iterative clustering and CG specific clustering uh, to allow a model to identify fit related topics with finer granularity. And also highlighted some issues with the um, uh, using topic coherence as evaluation metric. Uh, so uh, if we want to study how this the article's intended fit relates to the customer's fit experience, we can identify which fit and shape attributes co-occur with the various topic assignments. And this figure shows some of the most common fit-related topics common for each of the fit levels. For example, you can find that the loose and oversized articles more often have sleeve length issues, um, or upper body garments have a higher chance of customer dissatisfaction if they have a slim fit. So many more things can be extracted if you intersect the topic uh, assignments with the brand, manufacturer, material, region, and so on and so forth. Um, so how to use this in, in practice in Rexis? Um, the topic assignments can be used uh, in the following way. So they can be incorporated as prior information for some systems which rely on aggregated article return data to predict whether an article has size issues. Um, one can also use the topics as an additional feature for systems which detect article areas with potential fit and shape issues because customer reviews often contain the exact indication of what is wrong with an article. And finally, it's also possible to embed the topic labels into latent space and use the resultant embedding as an additional input for a record system. Uh, this a similar work has been done before. So um, you can also use directly this, the topic assignments for this purpose. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to the questions um, and one more announcement. So I'll leave this slide here. We are growing. Um, we have a lot of interesting ideas and projects to work in our team. Highly encourage you to get in touch and have a chat with uh, us about the career opportunities at Zalando. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evany. Uh, really, really interesting talk. I will uh, call for questions now. People can either raise your hand or or write something on the chat. Uh, it seems we have already a question from Fan. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the data description part. So on the slide, you said you uh, use reviews with rating uh, equals three or more. Is that correct? Or uh, I remember you mentioned you only use neutral or uh, negative feedback. So it's, it's smaller than three or four. Uh, if it was in the slides with this. So we use negative and neutral reviews. Maybe there's okay. a typo. Yeah. Okay, I see. I won't Just go back, but clarify. yeah, 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 correct. It's negative and neutral. And then we uh, basically we we have already reviewed the positive one, and we we think it does not have enough fit. 
related comments. That's why we decide to just go with the neutral or negative feedback. Uh, so, so you're asking why we are throwing <coughs> away the positive ones, yeah. right? Right. Yeah, because because the positive ones rarely contain any any complaints of the customers. So they would comment on things like, "Okay, this is great. This is great. The delivery was fast and stuff like that." While well, we are interested in finding like the issues, we want to know mm. what the customers complain about and unhappy about, and that was the purpose. So in our case, uh, obviously, you can extend it to the positive uh, reviews as well and use this information in the downstream recommendation. But for us, it's, it was more important to understand what the customers are not happy about to find out what kind of fit issues they experience. That's why we threw away the positive reviews. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. I will read it out loud. Thanks. Have you been able to use your results and clustering of reviews to directly improve product recommendations? Not yet. So we finished the experiments not so long ago, and uh, it's it's part of the future work. So as I said, we're planning to use this um, as prior information is the embedding, but we haven't conducted the experiments yet. Perfect. Thank you. Um, as you know, we're running, well, close to 10 minutes late, maybe. We will recover them during the break. Maybe we'll have a bit of a shorter break, but very interesting discussions. And I would like to introduce the, the next speaker, who is Favon. We'll present a demo on a, a new data set for learning graph representations to predict customer returns in fashion and retail. It's really exciting, I have to say, to, to hear so much about new data sets that we can all work on in the next, um, in the next few years. And uh, Evangne, if you want, uh, please look at the chat. There's some questions there that you may be able to answer. Welcome, Favon. You can you can start now. Hi, Umberto. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So thank you uh, for this time. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, PowerPoint. Share. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. We can hear you clearly. OK, thank you so much. Um, Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Fabon Zogong. I am a scientist at ASOS.com. Um, so we are a major fashion retail company based in, um, in London, in the UK. We operate uh, globally. And today we'd like to uh, present some research that we have conducted in collaboration with UCL as part of the um, CDT, for the, so the Center for Doctoral Training. Um, and that consists in applying machine learning algorithm and in leveraging our massive data sets to investigate how we can reduce returns with um, building uh, predictive uh, machine learning models. So just a brief summary. So um, ASOS in a few numbers is 26 million active customers, 130,000 um, products across 850 brands, three fulfillment centers globally, and we address 240 uh, global markets. Uh, so why reducing our returns? Um, because we, I mean, ASOS as a company has taken a uh, commitment uh, to uh, become and reach uh, net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2030. Um, so we have taken a number of steps through um, the um, organization, um, such as, for example, the online returns, uh, so paperless returns, uh, but also a number of other initiatives to reduce returns. Um, so, of course, there are, there are obvious financial and environmental um, challenges behind uh, the challenge of reducing um, returns at a major um, online retail fashion company. Um, so at ASOS, we have an AI team, um, which mission is to design and ship machine learning models at scale. Uh, we operate across a number of departments, um, building uh, machine learning models to support our business operations. So for example, we um, maintain our recommendation engines. Uh, we build the uh, supporting models for the search experience using semantic search. We also operate across marketing, pricing for retail, and returns prediction, uh, which I'm, go I'm going to present today. We also have a team um, whose mission is to build a forecasting model to um, predict stock and demand so that we can optimize um, our global operations. Uh, 
We're also working on partnership with um, academia. So we have this strong partnership with UCL and the Center for Doctoral Training for Data Intensive Studies. And this was a six month collaboration um, between um, the machine learning engineers and machine learning scientists at ASOS, but also PhD students and master students at UCL. So the task is, um, can we build a function um, that will allow us to predict live on the website if a customer would be likely um, to return an item recently added to the bags? And so for this, we want to um, investigate the um, expressive power of graph neural networks. So why graph neural networks? Um, because um, typically data sets around returns are multimodal. They are composed of free text, category called information, ratio data, sequences, sentiment. Uh, it could be images as well. Um, returns task um, so involve uh, looking at data points across products and customers with rich interactions between them. So that's naturally um, built into a graph. And also because usually um, on returns, we are faced with incomplete or missing values in the data. Also graph neural networks have been trending. Um, so DeepMind have used a graph neural networks to address the 50 year old grand challenge uh, solving it successfully. They have also used graph neural networks to improve um, the um, expected time of our arrival on Google, on Google Maps um, quite recently. And as you can see on the um, right side of the slide, um, so graph neural networks are a trending term keyword um, in the iClear conference. So we have massive data set at ASO, so everything we do is online. So every new interaction with the customer is a new data point that we collect. Uh, we operate globally, so our data sets uh, reflect um, interaction between product and customers across the world. Um, so the data, the data that we are releasing will be open source, and this is to promote research on predicting online returns, but also for recommended systems. And we would like to emphasize as a use of graph neural networks. So the data contains 2 million purchases and returns from 800,000 anonymized customers across our top 10 global markets. Um, the data contains a number of products. So we have um, aggregated 400,000 I mean, 400, product variants declined at the size level across our 11 most popular product types. Um, and so those products have been compiled across our top 10 um, ASOS on brands and third party brands. So in the data, we have also included our uh, most recent data feeds on return, such as, for example, the written business cuts, which have been refined, um, for example, to um, emphasize um, size related returns. Um, so in the data, we have um, extensively anonymized customers and product information uh, for um, obvious confidentiality reasons. But then um, the model will support, uh, enjoy all this rich information to make a prediction on returns. So on the right side, on the, on the right side on the, of the slide, you can see that um, we can build written profiles for customers and product depending on their reason for returning the item. And it could be that it doesn't suit, it is too big, it is too small. And so those information will be used by the graph, graph neural network um, to build the latent representation of a product node or a customer node, and then <clears throat> to build um, predictive uh, representation of um, the data um, to predict if an item will return or not um, when a um, new customer had this product um, into their bags. So the data is hosted on OSS. Uh, we have provided the link in the slides. Um, it is also in the paper. And so if you navigate to this link, you will have a number of files. So three main files, so the customer nodes, the product nodes, uh, but also the event table, which is the interaction between customers and product in terms of their purchases and returns. So when you download the table, these are pickled files. And then when you unpickle them, you will have three data frames. So one for the customers with all the customer features, uh, one for the products with all the product features, such as, for example, the brand, um, the average price, um, the average discount value applied, and all this information. And then the last table will um, be basically the links between product nodes and customer nodes. 
So from this data, um, you can build a graph. So we have done that in collaboration with UCL. Uh, we have used PyTorch geometry to uh, design um, the graph and to also model and train a graph neural network, which I'm going to present in, um, in a bit. Uh, but then, as you can see on the slide, uh, we have on one side customer nodes, so our customers, active customers shopping on the website, and then on, on the right, product nodes. So um, all the products we have in the catalog, which are described by all the features um, provided in, in the data. So once we open the data and we build the graph, we can visualize the graph. So this is um, visualization of the graph. Um, this is just a sample of the data, but um, so that gives us a cool video uh, first. And second, uh, this allows us to uh, build uh, intuition about the kind of difficulty in predicting returns. So here we have um, white nodes for products, blue nodes for customers, um, yellow links for returns and blue links for purchases. And then the idea is to address a link prediction task where we want to predict those missing uh, yellow links. So the data that we provide is split between training and test. Uh, training um, is, corresponds with transaction in the months before the test period. And then when you build the graph, you will uh, find that the mean product degree will be uh, five and the mean degree for customers will be around two. Uh, so just to give you an idea of um, the methodology to train a graph neural network, um, on the right side of the uh, slide, we have the input graphs that we have uh, compiled using the data set. Uh, we build a, a graph search neural network, which is composed of a few encoding layers. Um, so what it does is that it will learn to encode <clears throat> latent representation for product nodes separately and customer nodes separately. So we are dealing with an heterogeneous graph. Then it will um, aggregate the information uh, to form a final representation for each type of nodes. And then in the end, uh, what we do is that we, because we address a link a prediction task, we concatenate the representation of a product that the customer just added to the bag and that of the customer to end up with a link um, representation or a link vector. So this link vector um, is given to a multi-layer perception to endorse the final binary classification task. So this is the overall methodology, and this is very classical in um, representation learning. Running out of, of time, sorry. So I'm gonna um, accelerate a bit. So just to give you a few results. So we have compared the um, GNN with uh, a few baseline methods, such as for example, a linear model, a random forest, multi, um, a simple plain multi-layered perception or FGBoost. And um, so the GNN could outperform all baseline mo uh, models. Um, so we have tested the robustness across different global markets. And so we can see that G the GNN is very consistent in achieving better results. Um, so this is a summary of the data again. So this is a two month history of active purchases and returns at ASOS. The data is anonymized. Um, and this is a massive data set on uh, predicting online returns. So we believe this is the first of its kind and we hope it will help the um, community to um, build um, new recommended systems for sustainable fashion so we are also packaging a PyTorch geometric data loader to help with manipulating the data, and we are sharing our baseline um, and GNN models. So please watch this space. We have included the link in the paper as well. So this is an OSF link. You can download the data today. Um, you can also keep in touch um, if you have questions or if you want to discuss research around graph neural networks or recommended systems and written prediction. Um, and I just want to add that we are recruiting across data science and engineering. I have included a link with um, many offers that we have live at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, not only for uh, your presentations, but also for the contribution to the community, which is uh, really, really important, right? I will open up for uh, maybe a, a quick question from the audience. Uh, you can either raise your hand or write the question on the, on the chat. Maybe, um, maybe a question for me while we wait for the audience. What, 
what do you think are the most uh, interesting or promising approaches for, for solving this problem that you haven't seen already uh, discussed? Because we've talked about a few. Uh, is it is GNNs the, the future for the problem of not only representing things, but also solving the problem of returns? Yes. <clears throat> so I think the uh, multimodal aspect of the data is critical. And so the expressive power of GNN is very useful because then we can connect the data in many different ways. We can experiment with a graph by encoding a feature as a link or as a node feature. And so that gives us a lot of freedom in, in trying to optimize that function. Um, the other thing is that we can indeed um, store the embeddings uh, so we can reuse those node representation for other different tasks, for example. And we can also maybe investigate how we could uh, leverage uh, the graph to predict returns, uh, revert the signal, and predict purchases. Thanks so much. Uh, Reza has another question. You can yes. unmute yourself. for the great presentation um, and sharing of the work. I was wondering if we can also go all the way to predict the reason of return. Uh, is that something that you have considered or have experience with? Or did we stay at the level of will there be a return or no? Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, so we have discussed this extensively. Uh, so we wanted to start simple. So we wanted to address a binary classification task, but then we, um, it should be an interesting avenue to also predict the reason. Uh, so not all returns are equal. And so we know that there are very strong reasons why our customers would return specific items. So we could focus on a few popular reasons, for example, trying to separate between the different um, issues that our customers are having when they buy online. Um, so what we have is um, the customer profiles and the product profiles on the return reasons. So um, this information is included in the data set, uh, but then the label in the end. So the task that we have addressed is to um, just focus on the simple task of predicting if when a user um, adds an item to a bag, will this return to us or not? And then we rely on the maybe um, interpretability of the graph neural network to explain why it will be um, a, a return. Thank you very much. And I assume this is not in production. Uh, is that correct? Or if it is, uh, do you take an action actively with the customer that you estimate they would make a return? Yeah, so we have just completed this research, so it's not in production yet. Um, we are working closely with the product teams and we are investigating uh, you know, innovative ideas and use cases um, based on this research, but also based on other uh, machine learning projects that we have running at ASUS. But awesome. then I can, oh, sorry. I can give you one simple idea. So if we predict that a customer would a return an item that they just put in their bag, we could offer a replacement item, which is less likely to return. And now we have built this um, predictive function. Uh, so that's something that we can enable, for example, that's just an example. Um, and then if we have um, specific reasons associated with it, it could be sizing issues, for example, we could recommend a different size, for example, or we could uh, maybe um, ask a different model that will handle the size prediction problem um, to refine the prediction and then maybe to suggest a different size. Uh, so the interest of using graph neural network is that we want the, so we know a lot about our customers and our products. And so we want to be able to, um, using neural message passing, to transfer what we know about certain customers to other customers and the same for products. And so we believe that um, this gives a head start to the algorithm uh, when it relies on the graph assumption. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you. Um, and now we're moving to the next speaker, uh, who is Ye Yong uh, Ko, who will talk about contrastive learning for topic dependent image ranking. Welcome. Oh, wait a second. Perfect. We can see your screen and we can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. 
And just uh, a reminder for people who just arrived, we are running like 10 minutes late. Um, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, this is Jionko, who is the author of this work. Uh, it's an honor for me to present our research at this workshop. At, and yeah, let's begin. So at first, I'll show you an example to introduce our problem. This is a website of our shopping service. Uh, then uh, let's imagine that you are in shopping and you found a nice product whose title is Hooded Beige Dress for Women. In this case, uh, how did you become interested in this product? If there is no image, you might not be interested because there is no intuitive in information. Or if there is a weird image that do not represent the product well, you also might not be, not be interested. From this, we can guess that virtual information is inf important in, in online shopping. Now, here's another case. Which of, which of these four images is the best? The first one seems to be the best because it represents given title better than the others. Then see this problem more generally. Uh, here are four images of different products. Which, of, which one is the best for the title cropped sweatshirt for a woman? Uh, at first, the two in the middle look inappropriate because they do not fit the topic. Also, we can drop the last one. It is not attractive enough because of low quality. We can eventually select the first as the best. Uh, it is relevant to the topic and it looks attractive anyway. Of course, the selection should be changed depending on the topic. Uh, for now, we call this problem selecting the best image considering a topic. And it is the problem we try to solve. This problem may be solved like this. Uh, a topic and multiple images are given and let's call them a group. The function, of, uh, we input the group information to a function as the function outputs a score for each image. And then we can eventually select the best by comparing the scores. Uh, therefore, to solve the problem, we need to find this function. Then how to select the best or how to get a score for each image. We assume two things for this. Number one is the how attractive each image is to users. And number two is how well each image fits a given topic. And we also assume that the score is determined by considering both factors. In this work, we propose a method of click contrastive learning for topic dependent image ranking that can solve the problem by considering both factors. Here's an overview of click. It consists of two parts, dual encoder and auxiliary modules. Now, dual encoders are used to extract representation from data, and auxiliary modules are used to predict scores for given images. It is composed of memory bank attention and aggregation module. Click performs two training tasks, topic matching and image ranking. In topic matching, model understands relationship between topics and images. And in image ranking, model eventually select the best by predicting scores of given images. Both tasks are done in a trend manner. Yeah, at first, let's see topic matching. Its goal is to understand relationship between topics and images. And we achieve it by using contrastive learning. That con in short, contrastive learning is to uh, a training method that controls distances between data. It makes relevant data closer and irre irrelevant data farther away. In our problem, we compare embedding pairs of topics and images and then make the positive pair closer and negative pairs farther away. To define positive and negative pairs, at first, uh, from M groups, we sample M pairs composed of a topic and an image. 
and then define positive if a pair is composed from the same group and negative for the other cases. In image ranking, Click learns how to select the best by ranking images. In this task, model predicts a score for each image. We achieved the goal by metric learning using contra contrastive loss. As you can see in the figure, Click compares each uh, image embedding with a special query called group query. Uh, if an image is considered as positive, model makes it closer to the query. We define an image, uh, image as positive only if its user face feedback is the best in its group and regard the others as negative. Here, uh, group query is the most important part of click. This is because uh, shortly, it may click optimize two training tasks successfully. We experimentally observe that click cannot be trained without this. So then we can make it by using auxiliary modules. As a result, it is generated by aggregating given topic embedding and virtual image embedding. A virtual image is literally a virtual image embedding that is generated by a tension mechanism be uh, between topic embedding and memory bank. And here, uh, memory bank is memories of images that click already have encountered in topic matching task. For every training step, images from topic matching are stored. In summary, to select the best from a group, click perform two training tasks. In topic matching, model understands the relationship between topics and images. And in image ranking, model select the best image by ranking. Uh, especially with group query, click leverage knowledge from topic matching task. Therefore, model can predict a score for each image with topic consideration. As a result, model optimizes two loss functions simultaneously. We evaluated Click with one of our shopping services, an online special exhibition. As in the right side figure, its exhibition includes multiple uh, products with a single topic. Since each exhibition needs main image to express its topic, we try to use click on it. By using text as topic and use images of included products, click can select the main image of its exhibition. We collected two types of data sets for labeling uh, one, one use user CDR and the other use user review counts. For the offline evaluation, we compare our model with three existing ranking methods. And for the online, online evaluation, we had A-B testing. The baseline was to randomly select main image for each ex exhibition. For offline evaluation, we adopted two metrics, MRR and newly defined top K, top one accuracy. Simply, we use MRR to focus on predicted rank of actual best image, and we use top K top on accuracy to focus on actual length of predicted best image. And for the online evaluation, we compare conversion rates. As a result, uh, as you can see at the table or, or the figure, we found that our method is generally better than baselines, both offline and online. Uh, especially, it's an example of our inference results. In figure, uh, the topic is relevant to pants for men. From the inference results, we can guess that click predicts scores of images with topic consideration and differently than, than that the baseline model did not consider given topic semantically. Yeah, it was, uh, my presentation was done. And if you have a question. Thank you very much for your presentation. And once again, you can ask questions both using the chat function or the, you can unmute your microphone or raise your hand. I want to ask a bit more about your data set. Can you tell us how you collected it and what sources of, of data, where does it come from? 
<clears throat> our data comes from our uh, one of one of our service. Uh, it is called online special exhibition, and, and we collected data from uh, August to November twenty twenty one, and. You can see some detail uh, spec, uh, stat, statistics on my paper. And can, uh, can I see you now or? Uh, no, that, that's that's fine. But uh, what is the name of the, of, the, of the company, I guess, or the service that you provide? Uh, 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 the, the name of company is Naver, which is okay. in South, South Korea. And you can, Yes, the, the name of service is Naver Shopping. Okay, and so Naver is a search engine, right? Yes. Okay, perfect, yeah, got it, thank you. Um, is there any other questions? Maybe I will ask uh, the people who, who have questions, you can write them here on the chat while the break, and then I'll ask you to, to be able to maybe answer them. And we also have a, a, cha a channel on the Rexis uh, Slack. So if you're not on the Rexis Slack, this is a good time to, to join. I will send you an invitation and you can join the Fashion Rexis uh, channel where we tend to try to share information and share interesting work there. So join the Rexis Slack, Slack mm -hmm. and join the channel. And it seems that, um, sorry, it seems there is a question that I have missed, apologies for that. but. Has there been any counterintuitive results to your matching? For example, text to image that you don't expect, yet still most effective. It's a question from Mark. I don't know if Mark, you can elaborate on your question. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> First of all, thanks for the presentation, really interesting. Yeah, I was just wondering, like you started off with those images of that dress, right, with the hooded, um, description and in that case that did seem to me at least the most intuitive match uh, has there been counter examples to that where you know in some sense the text to image mapping is something that humanly you wouldn't expect but yet uh, in some ways it was validated to work better oh, uh, can, uh, can you speak some slowly I, I, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning of the presentation, um, yeah. you showed us um, the picture of the hooded dress yeah. um, and the description in text. And uh, you showed some va variation that was not intuitive, right? Four other pictures that we wouldn't choose to represent yeah. the text because they yeah. don't make sense. Um, I guess I'm wondering, do you think there are results um, of your mapping that um, in some sense you don't expect, but uh, on production it works better? Ah. So I'm thinking, for example, you know, I could think like a, a running shoe, like a Nike shoes, maybe um, if it's an Air Max or something, maybe some people actually would like to see the technology uh, close up. Uh, rather than the whole shoe, and that might work better in that case. So I I can kind of conceive of more counterintuitive results. Uh, yeah, I understand your question, and uh, in my memory, uh, I I I tested my model to not only fashion domain, uh, but also at digital devices or something. So uh, uh, I think I think uh, people people are more likely to interested in some functions of products in digital devices uh, rather than fashion. So uh, I, I think uh, in in fashion, uh, this uh, overall representation of image or design is more important than digital. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. 
Thanks. H have you uh, tested this model on production? Yeah, sure. Cool, thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. We will now take a 15 minute break. Uh, if the people who want to stay are, are fine to stay and maybe chat uh, to other people. Um, you can also join the chats and uh, Fashion X Rexis uh, channel on Slack for which I send the invite. Otherwise, we'll see you at uh, in 15 minutes or 17 minutes exactly for the next presentation. I will also pause the recording now. See you in a bit. And thanks again for the presentations. I have resumed the recording. So for one, for anyone who does not want to be in the recording, you can just mute your camera and your microphone. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. The floor is yours. Okay. Yeah. Then hi everyone. I'm Elizabeth. I'm from the University of Würzburg in Germany. And I'm presenting our work on personalization through user attributes for transformer-based sequential recommendation today. So first, a short recapture about sequential recommendation. Um, so in sequential recommendation, we have a sequence, an ordered sequence of, for example, movies, and we want to predict the next item in the sequence. And um, what our idea was, yeah, sometimes you also have additional information about the user and um, how can we leverage that to increase the performance of our prediction. Another advantage if, is if we have um, additional user information, we can use it to make recommendations even, even if we have no interaction data available. So for sequential recommendation, there have been yeah, a few popular transformer-based models um, been published in the last years. Most famously, I'd say Bert Horek, and they work as follows. So you have the item sequence and um, out of the item sequence, you can create one item ID embedding and a positional embedding. And this is your sequence embedding. In the case of Bert Horek, um, you use the mask training task and then feed the mask um, sequence to some bi-directional transformer layers. Then they get mapped back to the item space and you can predict the masked item. Um, another famous um, sequential or yeah, transformer-based model is SASREC, um, which we also use, but um, we use it with a cross entropy loss. So here we have um, unidirectional transformer layer and we use it with yeah, like I said, a cross entropy loss to make predictions. Now about how can we integrate um, user attributes? In our case, user attributes are, um, for example, the age, gender, or the occupation. Um, and what we do is we create a multi-hot encoding out of them. And now I, our idea was, um, we don't want to think about how to add this embedding whether we want to multiply it. Uh, we want to let the transformer itself deal with this. Um, so we prepend it to the sequence. And now the transformer layer can just um, learn how important the user embedding is in with respect to each item. And this is our approach. And we can also um, use it with the SAS rate model. And then it will look like this. Um, to have some comparison to this approach of integrating user attributes, we um, also use one pre-fusion method, um, which is in inspired by the KBAT Forex paper. Here we um, take the user embedding and add it to each item in the sequence embedding. Um, so now we have a pre-fusion pre version where we fuse the information before the transformer layers, our approach where we use the transformer itself to fuse the information. And um, as a last approach, we have one post-fusion um, variant, which is uh, taken from the latent cross paper. And what happens here is that we have our user embedding and we multiply it element-wise to the output of the transformer layers. Um, and we can do this for Bertrand and Zastek. So now for our experiments to yeah, see how this works. Um, we use two data sets. One is the movie lens data set um, because it's 
it's um, the movie lens one million data set. Um, it's one of the few data sets that has click data or, does, or sequential data um, and also user attributes. Um, it has the age, the gender and the occupation. And we also have one fashion data set where we collected um, click data from an online e-commerce platform. And we also have the attributes um, for age, gender on, and some sort of shopper type. Um, we have a few more interactions, uh, users and items in this data set. It's a bit bigger, but the average session length is far shorter. Um, so we are evaluating on these two data sets and we're using the hit rate and the NDCG to evaluate. First finding is that um, the ZASREC model with the cross entropy loss is performing um, far better than the Bertfarek model on both data sets. I think it's already been mentioned in this conference, but um, yeah, um, originally the Baird Verreck paper bet the Sasrek paper. So yeah, it's in one, one of our findings. Um, next for the comparison of the base models to the user, to, to the user models. So um, here we have the Baird Verreck models. Um, for the fashion data set, we can see that our integration of the um, user into the Baird Farag model can uh, improve the performance significantly for the NDCG, for the hit rate, not so much. Um, on the movie lens data set, we have improvements in all metrics and they are mostly significant. Comparing this to the keyword approach, so the pre-fusion approach, um, we have also significant improvements in comparison to the ba base model. It's also performing better than the user um, version that we introduced. Um, on the movie lens, it's not performing that well. And last, we have the latent cross, so the post-fusion um, approach. And we also see improvements in comparison to the base model. Um, but for the fashion data set, the KBED um, approach works best. For the movie lens, it's our user transformer approach. Um, if you now take a look at the ZASREC models and compare the base model to our approach, we again can see that we have improvements on the fashion data set, um, biggest improvements in the NDCG. Um, on the movie lens, it's not working at all. We even have significant, significant drops in performance. Um, then taking a look at the pre-fusion approach um, that is working a bit better on the fashion data set. We have also significant improvements in the NDCG, not so much on the hit rate. Um, on the movie lens data set, this is also not working. For the post-fusion approach, um, we can also see it works on the fashion data set, but not on the movie lens data set. Um, so what can we take away from this? Yeah, we can use user attributes to improve the performance of transformer models um, to varying but significant degrees. Um, we have higher improvements in the ranking metrics and um, also higher improvements in the BEAT models. Um, but there is no really a best way to include user attributes. It really depends on the data set and the model we use. We also did some further analysis and one of our experiments was about the session length. So um, our idea was the, that the inclusion of user attributes will especially help if you have a really short session. Once you have a really long session, you have enough information out of the session to yeah, know the intent of the user. And um, here we have on the left side, the NDCG at 10 for the different lengths of sessions for Baird and our user model. And you can see, see that up to a session length of about 35, um, we have gains in the NDCG and afterwards not so much. For the hit rate on the right side, um, we have smaller gains uh, for the shorter sessions. Um, afterwards, there are yeah, no, not really any gains anymore. But um, we, have, yeah, we had also already seen that um, the hit rate didn't improve it as much as the uh, ranking metrics. So yeah, we can conclude our inclusion of user attributes helps, especially for shorter sessions. 
Um, next thing we wanted to check is um, the cold start problem. So what if we have no interactions at all and only the user embedding? Um, with our approach, we can just take the user embedding, put it into the user SASREC model or the user BERT for REC model and get some recommendations. And um, here we can see that we beat the most popular baseline. And we can also see that the user BERT for REC model is um, performing better than the user SASREC model, um, which is interesting because um, the user SASREC model is working, performing better overall, but the user BERT for REC model could um, somehow leverage the information out of the user embedding better. Um, and for our last um, experiment, we did an ablation study um, where we checked the, yeah, where we trained different models on the different attributes for the user belt model for both data sets. And um, what we can take away from here is, yeah, we, all three of the attributes um, can improve our models for the fashion data set. The age is especially important. Um, but for the fashion data set, we can also see that the combined model using all three types is performing worse than um, the models using one of the single attributes. So there we can optimize further. For the movie lens data set, the combined model is working the best. Um, so yeah, that's, that's good <laughs> to know. Um, yeah, but this uh, basically, once we start integrating additional features, we also have to think about feature selection. And um, in the case of the fashion data set, uh, it seems that the model might not have the capacity to leverage all the information that is within the attributes. So our conclusion is um, that the transformer models can profit to different but significant extent from including attri user attributes. Um, we can improve the ranking. We have lower or really small gains in the hit rate. Um, and our improvements are especially um, for shorter sessions relevant. We can also use it to make some cold start recommendations. Um, but the best approach between all these three approaches really depends on the data set and the base model we are using. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm open for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question, or you can also send it in the chat. And we can go from there. I have one question coming in. So let me give a few moments. OK, let's get this one from Mark. Mark, would you want to unmute? <laughs> and have a discussion? Yeah, sure. I guess I was just wondering if you thought about uh, doing some clustering before you pass the raw features uh, that might, uh, in some sense, help just learn the structure of the relevancy of the features. And uh, maybe that would improve things. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, interesting idea. No, I haven't thought about that. Um, but for example, in case of the um, Shopper types, they are already coming from some kind of clustering algorithm. But yeah, definitely an interesting idea. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mark. And I'm waiting for more questions. Maybe I asked myself a question there. Uh, how significant is the result for the cold start problem? Because uh, it was not clear to me if uh, that table is significant enough. Uh, mm. Oh yeah, I don't no, I don't have it here. Um, uh, actually, yeah, I I don't remember. Maybe I just missed um, putting it in here. But I mean, it's it's twice as much as um, for the user that model than the popular baseline. Um, so yeah. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> I'm not sure right now. Maybe Sorry. A follow-up question is that, could we like roughly say that the number of like, the information we get from the session, what would be an equivalent 
that is for the user attributes. So if you wanted to compare them, because we said that for short sessions, user attribute is important. Uh, what would be the length of the session that the user attributes are not important? So can we say, for example, with the length of five, we have covered the user attributes? Mm, yeah, I think it, it would be this graphic. Like on the left side, you can see that after about a session length of 35, there's not really a gain anymore. So I think then you would have basically the information given through the user attributes covered by the sequence. Thank you. And let's see if we have more questions coming in. Okay. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Fantastic. Okay. And I pass it to Humberto. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. And we continue with the next talk, which will be given. Um, actually, I don't know. Will it be uh, Stefanos uh, giving the next talk, which is a Victor, uh, a visual incompatibility detection with transformers and fashion specific constructive pre training? Um, uh, I guess, Stefanos, you're doing the, the demo, right? The presentation. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Maybe my camera is a bit uh, uh, altered. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Perfect. We can hear you and see you perfectly. OK, great. So hello, everyone. My name is Stefanos Papadopoulos. I'm from the Information Technology Institute of CERN in Greece. And I'm here to present our work, uh, Victor, about visual incompatibility detection with transformers and fashion-specific contrastive pre-training. This work is performed in the context of Horizon 2020 research program, ITRION. So as consumers, uh, when we are considering buying a new piece of clothing, we may take into account the subjective appeal, the price and the quality or the brand of the item. But we also have to consider how to style this garment and how to match it with other pieces in our wardrobe. So given all items in a wardrobe, either our real world wardrobe or uh, in an outfit maker application, we have to consider numerous factors like how to combine different styles, colors, patterns, and, te and textures in order to create an interesting, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing and overall compatible outfit. So this is the problem of outfit compatibility. Uh, prediction and researchers have attempted to automate this process, typically with the use of deep learning neural networks in order to provide recommendations of complete outfits to the user or to complete the look, as we say, based on a selected item. Uh, previous works have defined outfit compatibility as a binary classification problem, meaning that each outfit is considered as either fully compatible or fully incompatible. This is applicable for e-commerce outfit recommendation systems that want to provide suggestions of complete outfits, uh, but it is not as applicable for outfit maker applications where users create their own outfits and they want to know if certain items are incompatible with the rest of the outfit. To, that, to this end, we define two new tasks related to outfit compatibility, namely outfit compatibility prediction as a regression task, where an outfit may be scored between uh, zero and one. And secondly, the task of mismatching item detection, which detects with specific items uh, that are not compatible with the rest of the outfit. So for example, in this case, the neon pink pair of trousers with this apple fine print is considered to be incompatible with this outfit, and it receives a score of 55%. Uh, so our method for address, addressing this task consists of three components. First, we had to create a method that generates partially mismatching outfits, with, which we call misfits. Second, we propose a fashion-specific contrasted pre-training, or FLIP for short, in order to fine-tune computer vision networks for fashion imagery. And finally, we propose a new transformer-based architecture called Victor. So we make use of the Polyvor dataset, which is a widely used benchmark dataset for outfit compatibility. 
Polyfor consists of fully compatible and incompatible outfits. So we use the compatible ones and we randomly replace from one to N minus two garments in an outfit with items of the same category. And we generate two or four misfits for each compatible outfits and we create the Polyvore misfit dataset. So previous works on outfit compatibility have either utilized ImageNet pre-trained models to extract visual features or fine tune the entire network for compatibility prediction. So the first approach requires fewer resources, but results in unspecialized visual features, while the second approach gives higher performance due to specialization, but it is very resource intensive. Instead, we propose Flip, which, is, which consists of a textual and a visual encoder uh, that project the features into a shared embedding space, and the whole network is fine-tuned based on the contrastive loss. This results in more specialized features while requiring few resources. And it also uh, is trained only once and then can be reused for numerous experiments. Uh, lastly, it does not require annotated data because it uh, relies on pairs of texts and images. Then we propose Victor, the visual incompatibility transformer, which utilizes multitask and multimodal learning and it is trained to predict both the compatibility score as a regression task and detect if any items are mismatching in the outfit. And Victor utilizes the visual and textual features from Flip, which are concatenated with a, a regression token, which is a trainable vector that we propose. And all of them are processed by the transformer decoder. So we first perform an ablation study, which compares the multitask vector uh, with the single task version of the model. And we also experiment with four different computer vision networks uh, as the backbone, which are fine-tuned by FLIP. So we can observe that multitasking consistently outperforms the single task version of vector. And moreover, we compare the multitask vector with unimodal, uh, and multimodal inputs. So again, we observe that multimodality, meaning that we use both the text and the visual features, consistently improves the performance of Victor. So we also calculated the floating point operations uh, when using features from Flip versus if we were to use end-to-end -end fine tuning like previous works. And we saw that FLIP achieves an 88% decrease in floating operations for a single experiment. But if we were to consider our study as a whole, this means including all the ablation experiments, we actually used 99 fewer uh, percent, uh, fewer resources than if we were to use end-to-end uh, -end fine tuning. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to examine Victor's performance as compared with the state of the art. And we observed that Victor is capable of competing with state-of-the-art methods while require, requiring significantly uh, fewer resources. And it even surpasses the state-of-the-art on the Polyvore disjoint dataset with 0.93 AUC score. We also provide a few inference samples where Victor is uh, able to predict not only the fully compatible outfit, but also detect the exact items that are mismatching. Of course, as any model of this type, uh, it also makes mistakes. For example, in the last outfit, while only two, two items are labeled as mismatching, uh, Victor predicts the whole outfit to be incompatible. But overall, we saw that uh, it, it performs quite well. So in summary, in this paper, we define two new tasks. Uh, or subtask, let's say, regarding outfit compatibility. And in order to address this, we create the Polyvore Misfits dataset. We utilized fashion specific contrastive pre training. And we developed the visual incompatibility transformer. Uh, from the empirical evaluation, uh, we show that uh, the multitask and multimodal learning can improve the performance of Victor. And it can compete and even outperform state-of-the-art methods on polyvore datasets while improving uh, 
uh, resource efficiency by more than 88%. So in regards to future studies, uh, it would be interesting to further modify Victor and to provide explainable prediction, something that could help even further the users of outfit maker applications with their choices of outfits. Uh, moreover, explicit knowledge from fashion stylists could be utilized to guide especially new users. Uh, but uh, since Victor is trained on the Polyvore dataset, it has learned to reflect the preferences and biases of certain stylists from the Polyvore platform. So it could be very interesting to explore ways of incorporating personalization and subjectivity into this process. And finally, I believe it could be interesting to examine other visually driven domains, such as architectural, exterior, or interior design. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefanos, for that presentation. As with the other talks, you can ask the question either by raising your hand or by writing on the a message to everyone here. We have a question by Abengni. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about this issue uh, that you mentioned, this failure case, uh, mm -hmm. where the model predicts the whole sequence as a misfit, essentially. It resembles me a little bit the uh, um, failure cases in NLP models where, you know, like things like repetitive generation, like things that do not make much sense. Do you have any insights, maybe explanation as to why this happens here in this model? Because obviously from a human perspective, it makes little sense to label the whole sequence as um, a misfit. Yeah. Uh, so it has to do most probably with how it is trained because we use the Polyvore dataset. And as I said, it consists of both fully compatible and fully incompatible outfits. Uh, there are many of them. Actually, it's kind of the majority, as you can see, from the, the fully incompatible and the fully compatible. So it has seen so many cases of fully incompatible uh, outfits that it can mistake it is more sensitive to such cases. Uh, if one was interested in uh, um, only training something to predict uh, mismatching items, we could uh, eliminate the full incompatible outfits with some. I see. So other you, you mean that the data set contains uh, sequences where all items are fully incompatible? Yeah, so the model has in oh, this see. type of data, so it is it can be sensitive in some okay. cases. Cool, thanks. Of course. Um, thank you. Is there any other uh, questions? All right. Uh, to make sure we can keep it uh, within time, I will move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Stefanos. Thank you. Um, this is uh, our next and last speaker of the day, uh, Jacek Wasilewski. It will be discussing their work on reusable self-attention based recommender systems for fashion. All right, thank you. Um, okay. I think you can start presenting your screen now. Okay. Um, all right, okay. Um, Right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Jacek, and I'm happy to present the work of my team uh, at Zalando, uh, which is on the reusable self-attention-based recommender system for fashion. Uh, in this short talk, we'll go through the context and the problem formulation, as well as a bit of the related work. Uh, we'll focus a bit on the model overview that we, that we took, the model approach, and then we'll uh, we'll go with uh, our offline and online experiments and some conclusions. Um, for those who don't know Zalando, Zalando is one of the biggest uh, fashion platform in Europe, and one of the goals that we have is to inspire customers and help them find relevant items um, that would match their uh, specific style. And one way that we do it is through recommendations of influencer created outfits. Uh, we heard a bit about, about outfits here. Uh, we are thinking about outfits created by 
people that say that are on Instagram that they they don't want to share their lifestyle and lifestyle and they also share uh, things that they create on on the land or we, we give them there this option. And we have a couple of use cases where we would like to present those uh, those uh, outfits. And that's where this re re reusable um, recommender system comes from, or the idea for re reusability. So our main um, use case is to present a personalized feed or catalog of outfits. We call it get the look, but essentially it's a rank in, uh, ranking of outfits. Then we have a very so some variation of that where we would like to present uh, outfits uh, fitting specific styles and we have a couple of styles that are that all the outfits are uh, can be tagged with uh, again here we, we care about personalization the third use case that we have is to provide in session recommendations based on the most recent interactions of the users with with the platform and finally uh, we would like to also recommend outfits that we find uh, could be relevant to the users based on the currently viewed outfits I presented here. So in general, because we are, uh, we have plenty of data that is sequential, or we can organize that, that uh, data as a sequential uh, data, we formulate the problem as a uh, prediction of the most likely next item. And as we know for that, uh, sequential approaches for recommender systems are, are great. Uh, here, I focus mostly on the SAS track, so um, as we base our method on the on the SAS rec, but we could also go with with BERT for for rec, and potentially other other sequential um, sequential recommenders that use transformers. And uh, we distinguish ourselves that if we compare ourselves with, with SAS rec, that method does not include any uh, item or user or contextual features, as well as uh, does not contain any interaction uh, metadata. In the in the original ver ver version, um, there are some extensions or uh, other methods like the BST from Alibaba, which for which considers contextual features. However, um, it does it in a in a different way. Or uh, one thing that it does not consider is um, this long short um, term uh, or importance for for actions that we we care about, and we'll we'll show in a second how we do it. So to, to summarize our contributions, we propose this reusable transformer-based recommender system, uh, which considers rich contextual item and interaction features. Uh, through that, we are able to recommend, provide recommendations to both um, recurring and cold start users. Um, we utilize some information about fashion and ease. Uh, by that, we mean that if you think about fashion, we have outfits, out, outfits are made of uh, articles, and then we also have have creators that they make out, uh, make outfits so we can have this we can find this hierarchical information and we can utilize that for our benefit and also here we uh, we consider long and short term user preferences and we try to model them and we also provide extensive offline and online evaluation um, this is our overview of the training approach for the for the model so we start with interactions we have three types three main types of interactions item outfit and influencer Influencer interactions, just as a note, is that on the land, the influencer they have their own pages where they have can have put, they, they can put there some uh, information about themselves, and we have uh, um, all the outfits of them are are presented, and then we tr we transform those inter interactions into input embeddings. I will go into that uh, into details in a second, together with contextual contextual data, and we put the contextual data as part of the sequences. At the very very first position, uh, and the contextual data could be a country, device, premise, uh, anything uh, related to the user or where the recommendation is placed. We have different uh, features for um, different features for the uh, different interactions, and then together with some uh, interaction metadata, for example, uh, interaction type or some temporal uh, aspects of the, the interaction, we pass it to transformer. And, and and we train uh, we, we get our final model. One thing here on the right side is because this is the next next item recommendation, so we have shifted targets. However, because we we care in this use case only on um, outfit recommendations, we do we only calculate the loss on those outfit uh, outfit positions. So we don't we don't calculate loss over all the uh, all the interactions. 
Now about the uh, input embeddings. Uh, here we have an example uh, sequence of four uh, items. Now we have different types of them. So we have product, outfit, and then we have also different types of uh, interactions like click, wish list, order, etc. And uh, as mentioned before, we because we can represent outfit as a set of uh, items that the outfit is made of, we can convert convert the sequence into a sequence of uh, articles. And then a single product would have one article, output could have more, and we, uh, that's how we represent our, our sequence. Then we can enri enrich the sequence uh, with our features, and we, have, we can have product-related features as well as outfit features. Here we have an example like colors, we could have influencers, um, and we have different types of features uh, for both outfits and products. If let's say an entity, a fashion entity does not have that feature, for example, single product, they don't have influencers, we just uh, fill those gaps with, with empty values. Next, um, we add the contextual features at the, at the very beginning of, the, of our sequences together with uh, action features. And here we only have like a the type of the interaction, but we can have as well, we'll see in a second, like uh, action recency or um when yeah action recency or when when that action was made and some other uh, features as well uh, we need to uh, encode those features that we have um what we use was essentially uh, one hot encoding uh, for some basic uh, simple features if we have more complex features then we use embeddings and for some we also use um like a buckets for let's say corresponding to some 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 uh, float numbers and the last thing uh so got, i mentioned that we would like to also tackle attract the long and short-term interests of customers and um here we, have, here we have an example that we might have on one day a different um, intent for our viewing session than on another day and we would like to reflect that so that the, the model would could properly attend to those interests or distinguish between those interests and we found a, a simple way of just adding some uh, adding action recency which is just the day num day uh, number of days passed from the training or influence timestamp uh, and that, that that becomes a, a feature in our model now let's move to the um, experiments our data set uh, consists of 60 days of user interactions and uh, that, that is sampled. Uh, we split the data into training and test using time-based split, 59 days for the training, one day for testing. And uh, it corresponds, let's say, that if we train the model every day, then we'll be using the model for one day. And uh, that's more or less the, the, the length of the test. We have around 10,000 outfits in the system. So this is our, our space of the predictions. Uh, we have various interactions, uh, clicks, purchases, add to cart, wish list. Uh, yes, and then uh, one statistic that is, is interesting here is that we have 23% of customers in the test that are totally new, so they don't have any interactions uh, before the test, the test date. And then 31% of customers that are new to the outfits, so they have some interactions with the platform, but no with outfits. So they, those two groups are considered the call, um, called start users for us. We compare this method and the method, uh, we call the method here AFRA. We compare it against other algorithms that um, that we used to use in, um, in production. And then when it comes to metrics, we focus on recall. Uh, we've seen improvements on all the metrics that we report here. Here we have relevant metrics. Uh, and also for recall, uh, some studies show that it correlates well with click rate. So we just simplify and we focus, uh, we use recall as our main metric. Now, uh, in the first experiment uh, that can be seen on the top, we compared AFRA with the, with the SASREC. And in this experiment, we only use outfit interactions to train our model. And what we can see here is that essentially AFRA is performing better. But the, the most interesting is this uh, the, the performance on new customers that even if we only use outfits uh, and we have plenty of uh, users that they don't have any uh, outfits in the training data uh, or the training part of the data, we can still obtain a reasonable or quite good um, performance for those users. 
And for Sastrick, we see that it performs uh, not great. Then on the bottom, uh, bottom part, uh, on the bottom table, we compare AFRA. Now we use all the available interactions of so both outfits and items. Um, and we compare them against the method that we, we used to have in, in production. Um, we wanted to verify first uh, if, if it would perform better before we move to the online experiments. And we can see here that in most of the cases, I think there's just one case that we don't perform better on the new customers, Puerto Rico at five. Um, but generally we see great improvements over what we used to have. Uh, in the next book experiment, uh, we were wondering about um, a case that right now we've been using interactions uh, up to some point where we were wondering how much we would gain if we could include also in-session interaction or if we, if we could simulate the in-session um, recommender system where we use historical information, but also the most recent information uh, that they can lead to um, an outfit interaction. And we can see that if we do that, um, we can, so if we include those most recent interactions, we can, in, we can increase the performance of the model even further. Um, and uh, moving to our online experiments. So we performed three A-B tests for three out of four of our outfit use cases. We focus on two metrics, retention and engagement. And uh, we see great improvements um, in our A-B test uh, results. Um, in two of those three use cases, for when we were comparing against a learning to rank approach, we see better improvements on the new customers than on the existing customers, um, due to mostly to the contextual information in, in, that we that we uh, added to the model. And to to summarize, so we propose a model that uh, works well across different use cases. Uh, and utilizes different interactions of various fashion entities. Uh, we can show how we should have shown how we can model short and long term uh, preferences and contextual information. And we, we, we shared our offline and online experiments. We show uh, great improvements. One of the, the future work that we are we were considering is to not only focus on the interaction that we see that user perform, but let's say to to add negative signals, so to add impressions to see, okay, if let's say we present recommendations and uh, some of them are not clicked, how we could utilize the system to, to either increase the, uh, the performance or to provide better, better experience. And also here we focus only on outfits and we would like to abstract the, our prediction head here to not only um, use like 10,000 10, um, outfits in the, um, to not only provide uh, prediction, predictions for 10,000 outfits, but more to extend that to like a million of items. And that will be it. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Jacek, for the great presentation. I will open up the round for questions. And um, as usual, you can ask the questions by raising your hand or you can uh, write them on the chat. There is a question by Justina. Hello, yes, by me. Uh, I wanted to ask, thank you very much for presentation. It was very interesting. I wanted to ask, um, and why did you use in the end as a metric recall? And why didn't you uh, show precision and hit ratio? Thank you. Sure, uh, thank you for the question. So we evaluated those, those metrics. Uh, I think the reason why we, the main reason why we re uh, report this one is just that uh, the correlation with the online results. So we're looking for something that could predict uh, to some extent how, what, what results we will get online. So we focus on Rico. Uh, and that's just, that, that, that's the reason. And uh, uh, other metrics, they were also better or not? Yeah, so we, we've seen a correlation between those metrics, uh, moving the same direction, all of them were performing better and then the baseline. So just for brevity, we use, we stick with one. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I'll, I'll want to ask uh, a question. 
Um, how do you think you can use this type of architecture or solution to increase the or diversify uh, the customer taste and be able to expose it to perhaps new new items, things like that? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question, and that's something that we uh, we also looked into. Um, actually, I have, I have a slide on that. So we look into the diversity. Uh, diversity is something that we care about. We briefly uh, check what what diversity uh, value we would get, and then when we, the specific diversity we were looking at, look we we're looking into was the temporal diversity. So how much we could change the result if we have a customer that go to the to the page, let's say every day, and checks what's there. And uh, to be honest, here we have not moved that value. So that's the temporal diversity. So seventy percent is still uh, is, is a new content 30 percent is the say recurring content um and yeah we are hoping to utilize the negative signals so the impressions to demote those uh, demote the um, recommendations of item of items that we've already recommended and we also had some user studies that were saying that yeah customers would like to see more diversity in our results Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, again for your talk and thanks everyone for today's okay. discussions. I think this ends our program and um, maybe I can uh, stop the recording now so it becomes a bit more informal. <laughs>